Good morning or good afternoon. Welcome to the second day of the Schiller Institute's two-day conference for the common good of all people, not the rules benefiting the few. Our panel today, our first panel today, is titled Weimar Germany 1923 Comes Again, Global Glass-Steagall to End Hyperinflation. The official announcement from Jerome Powell, the Federal Reserve Chairman, in his testimony before the Congress on June 22nd, was that consumer prices were up 5% in May compared to May 2020. But he explained this by saying there are temporary supply bottlenecks. It's an unfair comparison because prices fell last spring due to the pandemic. And he stuck with his line about transitory inflation, that it's here now, but it will soon be gone. The claim from Powell and his, his apologists is that the Fed is involved in a very difficult balancing act between keeping interest rates low in order to allow a flow of liquidity into the economy without triggering higher prices. And not once in his testimony did he mention the bubbles which have resulted from monetary easing, the debt bubbles in corporate debt, family debt, uh, government debt. And the, he didn't talk at all about how it's the nearly free money going to the speculators that's driving this. Instead, the Fed is committed to the Great Reset, the Green New Deal, and is pushing for these policies. In December 1995, Lyndon LaRouche delivered a presentation in Rome where he introduced his triple curve function, which he also called a typical collapse function. What he discussed is what we're seeing, what we've seen over the last 25, actually over the last 50 years, with monetary aggregates and financial aggregates going up at an accelerating rate and the physical goods production collapsing. And he attributed this to the neoliberal economic policies. Uh, it's been accelerated by the move toward so-called globalization, the end of sovereignty, and so on. Now, back in, on August 15, 1971, nearly 50 years ago, what LaRouche warned was about to happen, happened when President Nixon pulled the plug on the Bretton Woods system. What LaRouche said is that this would lead to further contractions of the real economy, while the financial and corporate cartels would be demanding of governments that they implement Shaktian economic policy, that is, austerity policies modeled on those of Hitler's Minister of Finance. Well, now, nearly 50 years later, we're seeing that LaRouche's warnings have been confirmed over and over and over with a series of bubbles and a series of shocks. Today, our panel will dissect the failed axioms, the discredited axioms which have been exposed by LaRouche over the years, the implications of this hyperinflationary policy for today, and what has to be done to end this by putting an end to the era where a financial empire can dictate the policies to all people. Starting our, our program today will be someone who's familiar to many of you from the LaRouche movement, a longtime associate of Lyndon LaRouche, the head of the French LaRouche movement, the party today, Solidarité et Progrès, a, a candidate for president of France who, had he been elected, we wouldn't have the problem we have today with the European Union. Uh, so our first speaker is Jacques Cheminade. Jacques? All my best to all of you. Why the challenge of public health, education, and food policy is a one? As we know, the brief US-Russia presidential joint statement on strategic stability presented to the world by U.S. President Joe Biden and uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin includes the following key common commitment. Today, we reaffirm the principle that a nuclear war cannot be won and must be never fought. It is, from the standpoint of our future, a step back from the brink. Nevertheless, that such an obvious statement had to be made shows how great and immediate the danger was. Was? Well, everything points to saying that it is still is. 
because the positive side needed to be able to secure peace is still lacking. What has to be changed is a way of thinking and acting mainly of our Western part of the world. This means to clean our act, which is the purpose of this conference. The Rarouche Doctrine, a document titled The Rarouche Doctrine, Draft Memorandum of Agreement between the US and USSR, had addressed this challenge. This was written in March 1984. Since then, USSR became Russia again. But 37 years after, the world situation has not only not improved, but become much, much worse. The unconditional sovereignty of each and all nation states is not recognized. There is no cooperation among sovereign nation states to promote unlimited opportunities to participate in the benefits of technological progress for the mutual benefit of each and all. Except for the Chinese One Belt, One Road initiative, there is no project for civilization. The point of this panel is to explain why. What is the financial, military, and social Damocles sword hanging above our heads, and what has to be done to get rid of it. The Western powers have allowed the central banks, the money changers, as Roosevelt said, money managers today, and their oligarchic controllers to create a dead end for a humanity caught between hyperinflationary destruction and deflationary collapse. This imper hyperinflation is not an accident, it's something willfully accomplished. Paul Gallagher will explain how this has been organized and aggravated after the August 2019 meeting of the central bankers at the, at the meeting of Jackson Hole Wyoming, the Jackson Hole Wyoming conference. They call that a regime change. They call it that it is a regime change. Using the same word for the global financing looting of everybody, the same as the one used to impose political submission of nations to their control through the responsibility to protect. To protect what? The feudal financial order under the hypocritical pretense of democracy. Under such a rule, real wealth collapses. The world impoverishes itself and less and less money flow into production and more and more fake money it's fake money, it's not normal currency, it's fake money, is issued. In the past six months, the US Federal Reserve assets, the asset book, grew by 94%, while the real physical despite all the media babbling. Paul will give you all the relevant figures, but let me give you one, which is a very significant one. To produce one dollar of real production after World War II, about a dollar of debt had to be issued. A bit later, it took about a dollar and a half. Now, in the last five years, to produce one dollar of production, about $4.5 of debt have to be issued. And in reality, the figure is much, much bigger if you include the effect of inflation. Two more figures define the situation on the walls of the financial cave. The figure of total stock capitalization compared to the U.S. gross national product, GNP, is, is of 370, uh, 17%, 317%, and it only reached 200, a 210% maximum at the end of the third quarter of 2007 before the collapse of uh, the world economy at that point. So it's much worse now than in 2007. Same type of increase for the ratios of real estate to the GNP. This is what defines hyperinflation. An ever-increasing flow of fake money 
issued by the financial system to accumulate monetary wealth at the expense of production and of the living standards of the population. In plain words, it is primitive accumulation against the common good and the future generations. Paul will show you what Ashmar Schacht, Hitler's finance minister, did to bring the Nazis into power in Germany and how he imposed brutal economic austerity. But that was not enough. It would have created after a too violent discontent inside the country. Something else was needed to support this amount of money, so-called money. The only available solution was to loot outside, to loot other nations. Paul stresses that in just two years, Schacht drove arms production from 2% of Germany gross national product to 20%. Let's then step back at this point to the situation in the United States today for a comparison. You can argue that there has been a bipartisan agreement, not definite, but of it is an agreement, for a 1.2 trillion infrastructure plan over a period of eight years, and that Biden and the Democrats are trying to get a 1 billion American families plan through. True, this might be to some extent needed expenses, but as far as infrastructure is concerned, it is mainly economic catch-ups. And the family plan money will be spent without a counterpart in real physical production. And that policy, much worse, is part of an orientation towards a, a Green New Deal, which is a bubble of all financial bubbles. Moreover, let's take two points. The first is that the military expenses of the United States are of about, according to official figures, $740 billion a year. But if you add indirect expenses, that puts it, and it puts us, over $900 billion. Two years of military expenses, therefore, $1.48 trillion, taking the lower estimate, are therefore more than the eight years infrastructure plan. Moreover, the most advanced technological innovations are directly connected to the Defense Advanced Projects Agency, DARPA, of the Pentagon, and to the InQtel investment fund from the CIA. Silicon Valley has been, from the start, their pet project, based on systemic, systemic data control. Overall, the American defense budget is superior to the most important 10 countries which follow the United States. It may be then exaggerated to say that the present U.S. policy is consciously that of a new Nazi Lebensraum. But as Eisenhower pointed to it in 1969, the military-industrial complex, or better say now the military-financial complex, carries with it more and more a rationale of economic and commercial warfare worldwide, which can degenerate in a general full-scale cyber war and then nuclear war, if led to its ultimate consequences. The triggering factor would be the British evil brain, its five-eyed brain, a five-eyed monster manipulating the American muscle into a conflict which would be a disaster for us all. The collapse of the Anglo-American Anglo financial system would make the impossible become possible. As Admiral Charles R. Richard, commander of the US Strategic Command, expressed it with his own words, is there a relevant opposition from any other Western country? You can find it in some declarations, Merkel, Macron, but they are all caught in the same system. To say it in other words, they deplore the present NATO's crusade against China, but, only, but until now, only with nice words. In the meantime, we saw the British destroyer HMS Defender 
provoke the Russian forces in the Black Sea, as it was said mainly by many, many speakers yesterday, and be promptly fired at with warning shots and bombs dropped on its path. Our Damocles world is within our world financial context, in the context of the present, present world financial uh, system defined by the Western powers, our Damocles world is another Sarajevo incident of this type leading to open war. Then let's go back to the title of my presentation. Why is the challenge of public health, education, and food policy a one? Because to create the conditions for this one, we first need a paradigm change for us all. It means, for instance, to accomplish what China has accomplished, a constantly improved life expectancy. And at this point, China is ahead of the United States on that. This is not a very well-known fact, but it's a fact. El Gazep LaRouche has many times stressed that the health system for all is what would make the coincidence opposites possible. In that context, France and Germany, Japan and China, the United States and China can work together for a common cause, a higher principle. Dennis Moore and the following speakers will explain how this can be accomplished economically through the LaRouche program for mankind's successful survival, a global glass to end hyperinflation, and then the other three measures of LaRouche's four laws. But I warn you, Microsoft and its financial source are already preparing what they call a hub health to control the data of every person on Earth, to control the data of every person on Earth. This could be good, this could be good in itself, if the intention was to create a better care. But it's all the opposite. If there is no paradigm change, the information will be transferred to insurance companies, which will then determine how much each person should pay, taking into account his or her profile of predictive medicine. This is the end of solidarity among human beings. It would mean that the poor and even, even the middle classes in our own Western uh, countries would be definitely left aside, unable to pay. And the poorest countries of the world would be imposed a Malthusian depopulation a Shastian slaughter. Even if there is not a war, this is what is already in preparation. So whatever our disagreements on some issues, all of us should unite to make this one of my title our first absolute human priority. If we don't do it, we become accomplices of a mutually assured destruction of our humanity. Let me conclude then with a quote of Emile Zola, the Emile Zola from J'accuse, who arose in defense of Captain Dreyfus, as all of us here arose in defense of Lyndon LaRouche. Zola tells us, when the future is hopeless, the present takes an ignominious taste of bitterness. Let's then bring about the best and healthiest of all possible futures, and our present, our one, will become a thing of joy for us all. It's our challenge. Thank you, Jacques. I, I want to remind everyone that we will be able to take questions after the panelists speak, and Jacques will be around for your questions also. Our, our second speaker is Paul Gallagher who has been writing about economics and financial policy for years. He's currently on the editorial board of the Executive Intelligence Review, and his topic today is the Central Bank's Regime Change and the Great Reset. Paul? Thanks. Uh, I'll begin with a basic principle. Linda LaRouche taught, and he also greatly advanced, the American system of economy which began with Alexander Hamilton's bold statement that the source of economic value is not landed property, not free trade, but human invention, the unique 
creativity of the individual human mind. The British imperial or free trade system is based on the idea that value or wealth come from trading and national wealth comes from international trade. Ability to sell with greater advantage than you buy is only part of this wealth. Inseparable from this is wealth from speculation on trade, on currencies, on borrowing rates, on future prices, on success or failure in trading. Human creativity enters the economy most often through engineering new infrastructure platforms. This is where most true technological advances are first applied and show up as new kinds of capital goods. LaRouche frequently explained this. Franklin Roosevelt's presidency and the following period through John F. Kennedy's presidency demonstrated it in action. A prime example is the rapid advances in science and technology within missions for space exploration, which is, after all, the development of new infrastructure, transportation infrastructure for space travel, communications infrastructure in space, navigation infrastructure in and from space, power infrastructure for power for space exploration and colonization, etc. Therefore, it's important to understand that there was a fundamental change in the worldwide economy for the worse in 1971. Until 1971, Roosevelt's Bretton Woods monetary system created constant demand in the United States and European economies for more investment in capital goods and new infrastructure, skilled labor, and family farm production. It blocked international capital from speculating across borders. After the 1971 fatal decision by Nixon to break the U.S. dollar from gold and the gold reserve, the floating currency system that replaced Bretton Woods incentivized and drove speculation and investment in speculation above all. In the half century since then, demand for new infrastructure and new capital goods gradually disappeared, giving way to demand for cheaper, larger scale production of existing goods. Cheap production exported into developing countries completely pushed aside Roosevelt's intention of capital goods exported into developing countries for great projects of infrastructure. Okay, the period of hyperinflationary pressure that we are now experiencing has been created not by pandemic and so-called recovery, but by decisions and actions of the major central banks under what they started calling their regime change in the fall of 2019. Here is the infamous inflation in Germany in 1922-3, known as the Weimar hyperinflation. This is the Reichsmark against the US dollar in the right-hand column, from a few hundred to one to many trillions to one in that 18-month period. Household wealth, workers' earnings wiped out. The German Central Bank did this unintentionally, but deliberately, by printing money to try to hyperinflate away Germany's war debts and reparations payments. But you see at the bottom, at the end of 1923, a man named Hjalmar Schacht took over the Central Bank, the Reichsbank. Schacht used a large international loan organized by the House of Morgan to remove the foreign payments pressure. He used the introduction of a new currency, which Schacht made extremely scarce, to suddenly kill the inflation. As you see, just about, just about four new marks, called Renten marks, to the dollar for the next 10 years. Schacht and the government used an extreme shortage of currency in imposing brutal economic austerity, defeating all proposals to add any productive credit to the economy. Suffice to say that Germany's unemployment rate was 12% before the 1929 collapse. So hyperinflation is indeed transitory, as our current central bankers insist. They may wind up ending it abruptly with its opposite, deflation, with potentially murderous results. Germany was a special case. The general case then in the 20s in the United States and over most of Europe was that after World War I, the regulation of commercial banks was dropped. 
Big commercial banks were allowed to take over investment banks and form stock speculation trusts. And bank holding companies were allowed to own investment banks, as well as what we call today shadow banks of all kinds. They became what are, co what are called universal banks, offering, quote, one-stop banking. That term was used by Wall Street in the 20s as well as now. Especially in the United States, big Wall Street and Chicago banks formed speculative partnerships with smaller banks all over the country, selling them securities, which these small and middle-sized banks sold in turn to their customers. In the United States, Germany, Italy, France, Austria, the big universal banks became loaded with deposits, but cut back drastically on lending, which is also the case now. The Federal Reserve even made liquidity loans to the big banks and even bought securities from them, quantitative easing, in 1923-24 and in 1927. These banks brought on the stock crashes and bank bankruptcies of 1929 to 1933. The process is well and thoroughly described in a book published last year by Professor Arthur Wilmarth of George Washington University entitled Taming the Megabanks, Why We Need a New Glass-Steagall Act. That was the solution. In the United States, the commercial banks were reorganized with their speculative securities washed out and written off in Roosevelt's bank holiday in March 1933. That reorganization was made permanent by the Glass-Steagall Act three months later. That write-off was deflationary. It meant that new credit was necessary on a large scale. Roosevelt said in a press conference in April 1933, you see, upon the closing of the banks, we put away somewhere around $4 billion. It was probably locked up before but people did not know it. Now it is locked up and people do know it. That is deflationary. So he knew immediately upon reaming out these in universal banks that the Tennessee Valley Authority and the Four Corners infrastructure projects were immediately needed. And the Reconstruction Finance Co Company as a kind of national bank for production credit immediately, an essential part of Glass-Steagall. That was the actual solution then. Here is Lyndon LaRouche now, actually in 2010, after the crash, which he had tried to prevent by promoting the restored Glass-Steagall Act in Congress. And if we do that in the United States, if we put through a Glass-Steagall reform, this will wipe out trillions of dollars of worthless paper. But wiping out trillions of dollars of worthless paper and discontinuing the authority of certain kinds of banks, the speculative banks, would mean that we would be able to save the U.S. economy, at least within the United States. Then we have to create a new system of credit. And in creating a new system of credit, we have to go to a fixed exchange rate system among the nations which participate in the reform. By going to a fixed exchange rate system, we can maintain basic borrowing costs in regular loans of one and a half percent or something like that as a base rate. We can then and must adopt a perspective of about two generations, about 50 years of rebuilding the world economy. The emphasis in the beginning, because we've deployed so many industries and so much agriculture, the tendency will be to go to infrastructure program. I'm sorry, because we've destroyed so many industries and so much agriculture, the tendency will be to go to infrastructure programs like mass transportation, for example, rail, maglev systems, improvements of water systems, as well as mass transportation to a much expanded emphasis on nuclear power as a source of power, to improvements in municipal systems and so forth. The improvement in the area of basic economic infrastructure will create a demand for production from industry. That's the start of the solution now. The universal banks, which had caused the 1929 to 33 crash, banned by Glass-Steagall for half a century in the United States and much of Europe, came back with a vengeance from the late 1980s. 
after London's big bank, uh, big bang deregulation of 1986, the regulators allowed universal banking everywhere. Today, it is banned only in China. The 2007-8 financial crash, as everyone knows, was based on this bubble of mortgage debt created by Wall Street and London Universal Banks and their pet mortgage companies. Households could not afford the soaring home expenses, so they borrowed them, thinking to make money in the process. Of course, this 10 trillion in debt, grown up by 2008, double what it was five years earlier, was only one small part of the worldwide debt bubble that crashed. On top of it was 10 trillion in mortgage-backed securities and perhaps 100 trillion in other derivatives bets. After this crash, the solution was rejected. LaRouche's Glass-Steagall solution, breaking up the universal bank holding companies and writing off their worthless securities, as well as banning home foreclosures while this was done, was rejected. Instead, the central banks began coordinated massive money printing to keep these universal banks liquid as their bets went bad and supposedly give them enough reserves to survive their next crash. The mortgage debt bubble was then replaced by an even larger global bubble of corporate debt. Some 13 trillion of corporate bond debt was issued from 2008 to 2018, that's the tall tan bar. That was more than in the previous two decades combined, the two gray bars. This is just one category. The total corporate debt bubble is now more than 80 trillion in the United States, 12 trillion, doubled since 2010. And again, on top of that, debt securities and hundreds of trillions in interest rate swaps and other derivatives. Here are the claimed assets of the four biggest Wall Street Universal Banks combined. You see a big expansion during and after the 2008 crash they had caused, then slower but continuing growth to a monstrous size while being fed by the quantitative easing money printing of the Federal Reserve. Then there is the immense Wall Street asset management firm BlackRock, which is counted on by Prince Charles and the great reset oligarchs to force thousands of companies out of fossil fuels and out of carbonized industrial processes and into wind parks and solar farms. It was called, that is BlackRock, was called a giant that emerged from the crash under the Fed's quantitative easing. Its assets under management were 1 trillion in 2008, 6 trillion in 2017, and almost 9 trillion now. This was all only the prelude to what started in the autumn of 2019, when the central bankers themselves called what when what the central bankers themselves called the regime change and which is about to blow out now. Go back to Mr. Hjalmar Schacht, the German central banker in the 1920s. After 1929, Mr. Schacht took a few years off to raise funds for Hitler from banker and industrial friends in Germany and London, and to campaign for the Nazis in 1932 and early 1933 elections. He found time to be in on founding the Bank for International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland, the so-called Central Bank for Central Banks. And he was quite a favorite with the Bank of England head, Montague Norman, and became a favorite with the British economist, John Maynard Keynes. In 1933, Schacht charged back in as Hitler's head of the Reichsbank and as Minister of Economics at the same time, with much more power than he'd had 10 years earlier. Back then, the deflationary Mr. Schacht had made currency very scarce. Now he printed money as no central banker ever had before. The MEFO bills he printed were his idea, not Hitler's or Goering's. He had a circle of the biggest banks and industrial arms producers form a dummy, dummy company, massively issue their own IOUs, and his Reichsbank bought them with new currency. By this plan, he took fiscal powers of the Nazi government, making the central bank dominant in what was supposedly government spending. 
That was a central bank regime change. More important was its purpose. That was a huge shift in economic activity across the board. As Jacques mentioned, in just two years, 33 to 35, Jacques drove arms production from 2% of Germany's GDP to 20% of it. Some other industries, for example, textile and clothing production, agricultural implements, housing construction, were throttled in the process. In the context of that shift began the labor camp system, which gradually evolved into the horror of the 20th century. There was the model. Lyndon LaRouche made a huge issue of it in the early 1970s when Roosevelt's Bretton Woods system was destroyed. LaRouche warned that what resulted would be Schachtian fascism. In August of 2019, central bankers met at the Federal Reserve's annual Jackson Hole Wyoming Conference and discussed a proposal by former central bank leaders from four countries, now all executives at BlackRock Incorporated, the world's biggest financial firm. They called it regime change. It was time, they said, for central banks to take control of spending powers from governments. The conference also discussed a presentation by Bank of England head Mark Carney, Mr. Zero Carbon of this, among the central bankers, who said the central banks would have to create a synthetic world currency they controlled to replace the US dollar. The reason for both proposals, the central banks must finally succeed in their 10 year mission impossible after the 2008 crash to set off inflation. They must create huge amounts of consumer demand by printing money and directly helicoptering it out. The truth, of course, was that governments needed to create demand for capital goods, new technologies, and productive employment in the way that Lyndon LaRouche had laid out, by issuing credit for new great projects of infrastructure. But such investments had been dropped 50 years earlier when FDR's Bretton Woods system went down. So instead, the central banks arrogated to themselves vast consumer demand for goods and services by their own money printing. And primarily, of course, among the consumers, the wealthy consumers would do this uh, consumption because their wealth would be greatly in increased in the process. Uh, through the stock market and similar means. In fact, whatever volume of currency these central banks were going to be uh, printing was doomed to be largely absorbed into new financial speculations of the biggest Wall Street and London firms. But the regime change went ahead, beginning with the Federal Reserve's resumption of quantitative easing in early October 2019 followed by the European Central Bank. The excuse was the US interbank lending crisis, the so-called repo crisis of September 2019. No pandemic was yet in sight to be blamed for this. Here is the scale of that late 2019 acceleration in transatlantic central bank liquidity and reserves printing through the universal banks. Up to now, I've been showing you graphs which ended in 2018 or 2019. That was to make clear the dramatic shift under the central bank's regime change policy, which can be clearly seen here starting in the fourth quarter of 2019. Look at the effects on the biggest banks. This is JP Morgan Chase, the biggest Wall Street bank. Look at the increase in its size just from the fourth quarter of 2019 to the first quarter of 2020, an approximate $250 billion increase in deposits and approximate $450 billion increase in assets in one quarter. And this has continued. JP Morgan's assets have now exploded by a full 30% in one year. But look at loans and leases. Now, unfortunately, the slide is not showing that bottom part uh, so well. But um, effectively, there's no change across from the first quarter of 
2019 through the first quarter of 2020, there is no change in loans and leases of those banks at the same time as their deposits and assets are exploding. Just as in the 1920s, the megabanks are getting monstrously bigger in deposits and assets, but they are not lending. The central banks have created huge undead universal banks, which essentially cannot fail because the central banks will not allow them to fail no matter how much of their assets blow out, but they also cannot lend. This must be stopped. The Glass-Steagall reform, as FDR and LaRouche each understood it, is the weapon to stop it. And here are the assets of the Federal Reserve itself. It is, after all, a bank, which creates its own new assets against a very thin slice of capital by printing money. This slide, although recent, can't keep up. The Fed's asset book is over $8 trillion as of early this month. So it is 10 times its size of 2008. And again, look at the sudden shift and acceleration in late 2019, the start of the central bankers regime change. The purpose of this regime change has become clearer since August 2019, especially with Mark Carney's new UN climate change ambassador role. While he still issues more and more central bankers orders in public speeches, companies must go zero carbon or die, he says. Investment in fossil fuels must stop. Developing countries must accept carbon credits as payment to stop their own development completely. Banks and big fund managers must enforce the total investment shift out of fossil fuels and into green technologies. Like Hjalmar Schacht, the central banks are using their money printing and regulating power together with the biggest transatlantic universal banks to drive a dramatic shift in economic activity. Their great shift is into what they intend to be a 30 to 40 trillion dollar green finance bubble, which will get them through a global debt collapse, the so-called Great Reset. This must be stopped. Is it like the Weimar hyperinflation or the verge of a deflationary collapse? Central banks have created both. What is critical is that it must be stopped. Glass-Steagall breakup of these banks in every nation and nationalization of central banks to create national credit institutions for productivity and productive employment is the way to do that. That concludes my presentation. Back to you, Harley. Well, thank you, Paul. That was very timely. Uh, our next speaker will be Dennis Small, who has been the director of LaRouche operations throughout Ibero America for the last several decades. Uh, he's on the editorial board of the Executive Intelligence Review, and his topic for today is Double or Nothing, the LaRouche Program for Mankind's Durable Survival. Dennis? Lyndon LaRouche wrote a book in April of 1989, which is 32 years ago now, called In Defense of Common Sense. There are two notable things about this book. One is the content, which I'll say something about in a few moments. The second is the fact that he wrote it in jail, in Alexandria prison in particular, where he had just begun to serve what would be a five-year sentence for crimes which he, of course, never committed but for which you, American citizens and citizens of other countries alike, continue to pay the price. During his 1989 to 1994 incarceration, Linda LaRouche wrote three books, of which In Defense of Common Sense was one, another was Project A, and a third was The Science of Christian Economy. This last was republished by the LaRouche Legacy Foundation in volume one of the collected works of LaRouche last year. That volume is focused principally on economic issues. Volume two, which will be appearing later this year and which is focused on creative and uh, cultural matters, music and so forth, will include three other essays of LaRouche's from prison that he wrote in prison, including Mozart's 
1782 to 1786 Revolution in Music and on the subject of metaphor. LaRouche accomplished more in jail than most people do in their entire lifetime, but that is not our topic today. In his April 1989, In Defense of Common Sense, LaRouche wrote the following, and I quote, a swimmer is rescued from the sea, moments before his strength had ebbed fatally. This is momentary survival. Is this a paradigm for the successful survival of an entire society? How must we distinguish between merely momentary and durable survival? Linda LaRouche then continued. That selected moment serves as the time of departure for a continuing journey into the future. Regard that journey into the future as if it were a kind of mathematical physicist's continuous function. Continuously, cause generates effect, and effect has a causal relationship to the subsequent effects. This function is expressed in terms of increase or decrease of a magnitude termed potential population density. This is no ordinary or linear sort of continuous function. It is nonlinear, but not the less an efficient, excuse me, not the less an efficiently continuous function in experimental terms of reference. Close quote. Now that is our topic today. What economic policies must be implemented? In this, the midst of the worst civilizational breakdown crisis we have faced since the new dark age of the 14th century, policies that are required to ensure the successful, durable survival of mankind into the limitless future. Now, as in the 14th century, a global pandemic is today posing a crisis that is so devastating that it has actually opened up a window of opportunity for a revolutionary change in the entire structure of society, a new paradigm, a renaissance. The cause of the pandemic, as LaRouche demonstrated over 30 years ago, is a plummeting collapse of man's potential relative population density. That means that man's power to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it has fallen below break even, way below break even. The anti industrial economic policies of looting of the last 50 years have left mankind with half the number of productive jobs that are needed, half the job, excuse me, half the food we require to nourish the population, half the hospitals and medical personnel needed to combat the aggressive virus, and half the electricity needed to maintain that infrastructure and productive economy. Is it really surprising then that a mere coronavirus has gotten the better of us and continues to scorch a path of destruction across the planet? We, of course, need vaccines for all 7.9 billion of us. Today, the latest numbers is that 2.6 billion doses have been administered, but only 0.3% of those have been administered in low-income countries. This is suicidal on the face of it, given what we know about the way the virus is spreading across the planet. In addition to vaccines, we need modern health systems. We need hospitals. For example, in the developing sector, we estimate that we need 30,000 new hospitals with approximately 10 million new beds just to reach standards that are acceptable by modern uh, conditions, for example, in Europe today. Doctors and nurses also have to increase. We need to provide electricity. We need water. We need the other facilities that are required, transport and so on, to make these hospitals and the rest of the health system function. A global Army Corps of Engineers is going to be needed to bring this about in the developing sector in particular. The COVID pandemic has merely pulled back the veil on what have been Malthusian depopulation policies over the last 50 years. Now, Linda LaRouche countered this immoral, unscientific claptrap of Malthusianism in that same book, The Defense of Common Sense. And he said the following, and I quote, Today, there are more than 5 billion persons. Had the world as a whole employed to the degree it might have done so, the levels of technology already available by 1970, not only would the planet's population be significantly larger than it is, 
the average standard of living per capita would have approximated that of North America in 1970. And the population potential, as distinct from the actual population, would be approaching 25 billion. LaRouche continued, the increase of both the actual and the potential population densities during the recent thousands of years is the outcome of the continued and interdependent generation, transmission, and efficient assimilation of scientific and technological progress. Now, if we return to the pedagogical indications in that population density, the potential relative population density graphic, we can see the way successive technological leaps produce the following kinds of changes in that function. This is precisely the sort of nonlinear continuous function that Lyndon LaRouche was referring to in his book. It describes discontinuities in the previous patterns of metrics uh, of, the, of the physical economy, but they are caused by a continuous scientific and technological advance that produces those leaps. Stated otherwise, if we want to double employment, double food production, double energy production, uh, double the uh, power that is uh, bringing about these effects, we have to take recourse to the power of human mind that is producing that capability to have those doubling policies. We have to find the location of that power, which is outside the domain of that which is being doubled. It is in the domain of creative human activity, of technological advance, of classical culture per se. Now, those of you who have performed exercises in constructive geometry with the idea of doubling the square and doubling the cube will perhaps have an idea of the kind of process that I'm referring to, an understanding of the principle of physical economy, which was at the very heart of Lyndon LaRouche's fundamental discovery. Now, today, almost half of the world's labor force of 3.5 billion people is not productively employed. Many have no jobs at all. A large number of them, the largest amount, are employed in the so-called informal sector, where they may make some money by hustling, but they are not producing any actual productive value through no fault of their own, but because of the nature of the current system. They are forced to engage in menial labor, in services, in drug running, in all sorts of unproductive and destructive activities. This is why we have developed a program which begins with a requirement of producing 1.5 billion new productive jobs to employ all of those who are now unproductively employed. They must be employed in building hospitals, in constructing highways, high-speed rail lines, power plants, schools, new factories, and also employed in tearing down casinos and other dens of iniquity, which is a topic we will come back to shortly. Over a generation, we will be transforming this world labor force according to the proportions and concepts provided by Lyndon LaRouche, as he has recommended them. Unemployment will virtually vanish. 50% of the labor force will be employed in goods producing activities in industry and so on. And a crucial 5% will be in the R&D sector, that is in that forge of the technology and the science, which through application in the machine tool principle, produces the actual increase in value, the increase of the productive powers of labor. Now, one major problem we have to address is food or the lack of food. The UN and other international agencies estimate that 690 million people go to bed hungry every night. And that number is rising. A billion people are malnourished. 10 million will die from hunger this year. And hundreds of million are threatened with death through starvation if we don't reverse these policies. Four million have already died from COVID and probably much more than that when the real numbers come in. Why do we tolerate this? We can easily double food production. We can do this in different parts of the world in the advanced sector where yields can be further increased, but especially it can be done in areas of the world which are now not uh, engaged in productive uh, agricultural activity, but can be with the necessary capital goods, irrigation, tractors, uh, infrastructure, and other inputs. We can and we must increase grain production as a metric of food overall 
from its level today of approximately 2.3 billion tons of grain, every living person, all 7.9 billion of us, needs about one half a ton per year. So we're talking about needing 4 billion tons per year, rising up to 4.8 billion tons over the course of the next generation. And that grain is both for direct consumption and for producing animal protein. Yes, animal protein, which is an absolutely essential part of any healthy diet. Now, one of the areas of the planet where we can achieve this vast increase in agricultural production is two areas of South America. One is the Colombo-Venezuelan Plains, and the other is the Brazilian Cerrado, which you see displayed on this map. Our estimates are that we can bring 255 million new hectares into production in these areas. That will increase grain production there by 200 million tons a year, excuse me, 290 million tons a year, compared to the 160 million tons today. That's almost a triplet. But what's crucially required, besides the inputs of fertilizer and uh, tractors and so on, is infrastructure, railroads, which don't exist there now, as you can see, and which has always been a vital part of the dramatic increases of economic activity in the agricultural and in the industrial sector. And I refer you back to what Lincoln did in the United States with the Transcontinental Railroad. This vast increase in infrastructure, especially high-speed rail across the planet, is what you see in this map. This is the Schiller Institute's World Land Bridge proposal expanded from China's New Silk Road or Belt and Road Initiative, and it is a backbone of global economic development. Today, 140 countries with two-thirds of the world's population participate in the Belt and Road Initiative. The United States is conspicuously absent. It should join. It's necessary for the world, and it's necessary for the United States economy. If we turn to energy, vastly increased amounts of energy per capita are required and will be needed to build the health system for starters, needed for the food, for the transportation, for the railroads, for the factories, and so on. Total electricity uh, consumption today on a world scale is about, uh, has installed capacity of seven terawatts. For simply improving the world health system to the levels required to stop the pandemic, we are going to need another two terawatts of installed capacity. To get the entire world up to the per capita standard that China now has, as you can see reflected in this chart, total capacity is going to have to double from 14 terawatts, uh, two to 14 terawatts over 25 years from the level of seven today. That's a doubling. The US has a vital role to play as a revived engine of global economic development including in the health area, and its energy production must rise as well to double its current capacity. Now, let's put this in perspective. Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining, as you may have heard, is all the rage in monetarist and speculative circles. They say that we have to stop the fiat money and the quantitative easing, which is being done by the Federal Reserve and other central banks. That's true. They say the way to do it is to simply repeat in a modern form the policies of Milton Friedman and his famous K percentage rule, which is to simply increase the supply of money by a fixed predictable amount, a limited amount every year. And that'll do it. It's waving the magic wand. Well, that policy has been proven to be unscientific quackery numerous times coming from the mouth of Milton Friedman. And it is more so in terms of the Bitcoin because there's an additional wrinkle with a Bitcoin, which is not simply the issuance of money and that does it, but the way Bitcoin is issued or mined, quote unquote, has nothing to do with mining per se, as we would know it. Mining Bitcoin means putting up arrays of supercomputers, which consume inordinate amounts of electricity to work on very complex mathematical puzzles. The first person who solves those puzzles gets some Bitcoin. Now, you might say, well, you know, this is just an adolescent game. It's relatively innocent, except it isn't, because the amount of energy which is consumed in Bitcoin mining on a world scale is 116 terawatt hours of electricity per year. That's more than is consumed in the entire nation of the Philippines, 
and the entire nation of Holland. Moreover, put this in perspective, if that electricity were put to actual productive use, it would be almost one quarter of all the electricity required to power the 30,000 new hospitals that have to be developed and built in the less developed countries, the LDCs, which is about 525 terawatt hours per year. I think the point is obvious. It's absurd to use this for Bitcoin mining when it could be used for something productive. By the way, the majority of Bitcoin mining, so-called 65% of it, occurs in China, right? Because there's relatively cheap energy there. I should say occurred in China because the Chinese government is wisely cracking down on this because they think this is totally destructive. So the Bitcoin miners are discussing and have decided where they're going to move, where there is also plentiful energy and a welcoming environment. And that location is Texas. Yep, Texas. If you add on to Texas's already overloaded electricity grid, the amount of electricity required for Bitcoin mining, you're adding 22% onto that. That should work out really well for Texans and for the rest of the country as well. Now, I'd like to conclude with some much needed help from Lyndon LaRouche personally on the concept of productive and unproductive employment and on his proposal on the four laws. The four laws you are familiar with, I am sure. Uh, if not, I'll remind you, LaRouche presented the idea of the need to go through a bankruptcy reorganization of the current world financial system through Glass-Steagall, as has already been discussed, to establish Hamiltonian banking systems to channel productive credit for productive activity of the sort we've been discussing with the World Health System, to establish global infrastructure projects where countries can cooperate for rapidly increasing the productive powers of labor, such as the Belt and Road Initiative, and LaRouche says, focus on those areas of scientific advance, of technological breakthroughs, which are, in the final analysis, the motor force that drives real economic development fo forward through nonlinear leaps of the sort that we have discussed previously. Now, I want to show you a very short video clip from a town hall meeting in New Hampshire in 1980 during the presidential campaign. And you will see here that LaRouche draws a very fine distinction between productive labor and unproductive labor. And I believe this is probably the first place where Lyndon LaRouche ever presented the precursor to what later became Lyndon LaRouche's famous four laws. I'm going to do what Roosevelt promised to do in 1940-42. What Franklin Delano Roosevelt, of all people, promised to do, I'm going to do it. <laughs> he said, and prohibition. <laughs> now, put the drug interest in jail, among other things. Now, Roosevelt promised to Churchill at the Atlantic meeting and the Casablanca meeting. He said, no more will the United States fight world wars to save the British Empire in any shape or guise. No more will the United States tolerate the British system, whether colonial or neo-colonial. No more will the United States tolerate the economics of Adam Smith in any part of the world. We are going to take this aching, poor, hungry world and we're going to transform it with American methods. We're going to transform it by export and development of high technology. We're going to have Manhattan projects and NASA projects and every dirigist federally directed scientific Christ program that we deem necessary. You know, some people talk about how many nuclear plants can you build. I understand American methods. If I want to build 10,000 nuclear plants by the year 2000, we'll do it. It can be done. If we putter along the way we'd like to do it, it won't happen. 
You want to have 50 or 100 nuclear starts a year, we can do it. Just take the table of requirements. We need how many steel plants, how many of this, fill them all right now. If we have to melt down the neon signs on the whorehouses to do it. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, for those of you just joining us, let me tell you, you are on the third panel of the Schiller Institute Conference. The topic today is Weimar Germany 1923 comes again, global Glass-Steagall to end hyperinflation. Uh, we're now, uh, let me remind you again that if you have some questions for the Q&A, you can send them to questions at schillerinstitute.org and we will have plenty of time for questions. Uh, so our next speaker is a state senator from Kansas, Senator Mike Thompson, who's the chairman of the Senate Utilities Committee there. And his topic is how Americans are herded into green energy by weaponized, politicized, monetized science. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the Schiller Institute for inviting me today here to this conference and for everybody uh, on the conference. Uh, this is such an important policy issue, and there's so many out there, and this is just one that we're dealing with. And my name is Mike Thompson. I'm a senator from the 10th District in Kansas. Um, this is my first term as a senator. I actually uh, took over from the previous senator last year in her final year of her term, and then I ran for re-election and won this year in an area that's very, very competitive. Kansas was uh, used to be a red state pretty solidly, but uh, some areas, particularly larger areas where I'm in in the Kansas City Metro and, and uh, some of the outlying counties are, it's becoming increasingly blue and it's, it's a worrisome situation, but uh, fought hard, worked a thousand, walked a thousand miles last year to get elected. And uh, now I'm the utilities chairman for the state of Kansas. And uh, one of my big issues is this energy policy and what we're facing. And uh, it, it's a problem here in Kansas. Uh, we've got too much wind power as it is. Uh, my, in my previous life, uh, previous career, I was a meteorologist. Uh, I was on television for almost 40 years, but I was trained in the Navy on an aircraft carrier. Well, I went through the Naval uh, Weather Schools, was on an aircraft carrier. And so I've been involved in weather and climate for four decades. And I've been seeing this steady gaslighting of the American public regarding CO2 and climate change, which started off, as you recall, first as, as global cooling back in the 70s and then turned to global warming in the 80s. We had the big heat wave in 1980. Uh, the academics saw that the global cooling wasn't working, so they switched to global warming. And then when it didn't, we had a plateau in the late 90s. Uh, then they decided, well, let's go with climate change because it just, it makes it easier for all of us. And it's, it's nothing more than a scam. I could send, spend two hours talking about that. It is nothing but a weaponization, politicization, and, and uh, monetization of science uh, to use to herd Americans into, uh, for one thing, this green energy revolution that we've been seeing. And here in Kansas, uh, as a result of that, for, since 2007, uh, when we had only 2% wind turbines uh, as our generating capacity out, out here in the state, uh, we now are up to about 41%. As a result, our electrical rates in Kansas for all three, the residential, industrial, and commercial rates, went from below national average to now above national averages. And we've instituted more wind uh, nameplate capacity here in the state of Kansas than the surrounding states. And as a result, we are not competitive anymore with large businesses and uh, institutions that use a lot of electrical energy. Uh, there are some little pockets in Kansas like McPherson uh, that does pretty well, but they've got a, a different paradigm and a different model from many other areas of Kansas. And so that's a big problem for us. And unfortunately, um, there was a, 
there's a new sustainability transformation plan from Evergy, which is our big uh, IOU. It's the investor owned utility in Kansas. It's the only one that we have. And basically what they're doing is they're getting a, a AAA bonding from the state of Kansas to retire coal plants and replace it with wind and solar. Uh, so we're taking all of our eggs out of a reliable generating capacity and putting into non-reliable intermittent wind and solar. And if you do the deep dive on the wind, uh, you know that you know it doesn't blow most of the time. In fact, in certain ports of eastern portions of eastern Kansas, there are 230 days a year where the wind doesn't blow enough to produce electricity. And when it does, uh, it maybe one day out of every three years hits the rated capacity of wind speed. It, it you need wind to be blowing steadily at 25 miles an hour to produce a nameplate capacity on a, a wind turbine. So say it's a two megawatt wind turbine. The wind would have to be blowing consistently, steadily for 24 hours to produce two megawatts of energy. So it makes absolutely no sense to take away you know, our coal plants, and it's undermining them from a cost standpoint as well, and, and putting it into these highly subsidized uh, renewable energy sources that if they weren't subsidized could not stand on their own. They don't produce enough electricity to do so. Uh, there's not the battery storage that's in place uh, to be able to do so. Um, we have one nuclear plant in the state and with the capacity to add a second reactor, but the cost and the regulation is so prohibitive. I've talked to the, uh, the uh, utilities and it's just not in the cards. Uh, and to complicate matters, we're part of the Southwest Power Pool, which is 11 state region. And as a regional transmission organization, an RTO, they could care less whether we add more wind. They like it because, you know, they're able to, uh, the wind, because it's so subsidized, comes online at a cost that clears the market before our coal and our natural gas plants and our, what few diesel plants we have can come online and, and, and generate electricity. So whenever the wind is available, it's undermining our base load plants that we rely on 24 seven for electricity. It's a, it's a very complex mess. And the more wind, the more solar that we add to the mix is going to turn Kansas into a situation where we are uh, unreliable during Arctic outbreaks. You saw what happened in Texas during the Arctic outbreak. Millions of people were without power. Uh, the wind did not come through down there. They had uh, some plants that were uh, not ramped up. What happened here, we have excess capacity. We, we, our peak summer load is about 50,000 megawatts. We have 90,000 megawatts of generating capacity. We should not have had one single blackout in the state in February when we had that Arctic outbreak of bitterly cold air, but we did have rolling blackouts. And Southwest Power Pool, we have, they have some questions to answer. You know, why with all this excess generating capacity did we lose power? The wind claims that they outperformed uh, their expectation, which is uh, turned out to be somewhere around 1% in the entire 11 state region. Well, that's sort of like saying the water boy outperformed really well, and that's why the Kansas City Chiefs won the football game. It just it just doesn't make a bit of sense. So that's kind of the, the overview of the situation here in Kansas and what we're fighting. Invenergy is a big wind company, and they plan on adding an additional 1,000 wind turbines to the state. Uh, we've already paid for huge amounts of transmission lines in Kansas, and we'll pay for more. And most of that wind energy sold outside of the state. So we're paying for the infrastructure, but we're not getting any of the benefits. Uh, not that there's really that much benefit to begin with. And so that's going to be increasingly put a, a more of a load on rate payers in Kansas. And as we see this proliferate throughout the Midwest and in, in states uh, like Nebraska, which I, I know is going to be next on the list. They're going to try to add more wind up there. And Wyoming, I know, is trying to fight this. You're going to see more of these same problems. Less reliability, increased electrical rate costs, 
and uh, retirement of plants that we rely on. And, you know, there's only, what, 98 reactors, I think, nuclear reactors in the United States that are operational right now. I think there was one under construction. I think it may have been halted. So nuclear, which is a wonderful source of electricity, uh, is being ignored. Uh, what's interesting in the polar vortex, the very cold air that we had, part of the problem was our, our uh, generating plants did not have firm delivery contracts for natural gas for a third of their supply. And so they were going out and buying that on the market. And when that cold air hit, the natural gas spiked to at some point $625 uh, per uh, metric cubic uh, foot or ton, I think it is, uh, MCF of uh, natural gas. Normally it's one to two dollars. And so there are some people in Kansas that had a hundred thousand dollar gas bills or higher, uh, just because there was no reliability there. So it's it's a very, very complex problem that we're dealing with. And it's being complicated because of the renewables. Uh, if we didn't have all this wind, if we didn't have all this solar, we'd be looking to our reliable sources and firming them up and doing what we need to keep them in good shape, but unfortunately we're not. Uh, and you just, all you have to do is look to California and PG&E, Pacific Gas and Energy out there, because they've gone so heavily into renewables, they can't even afford to do the maintenance on their transmission lines out there well enough uh, to serve the customers. That's part of the reason they had the issues with the, uh, the wildfires over the recent years is because they, they weren't able to clear the brush, uh, the maintenance on the lines were a problem, and pg and es bankrupt. Well, that, that's what we're gonna do here. And I think I saw this morning that Evergy was downgraded. Uh, I, I just glanced at an email. So at any rate, we've got a very messy problem here in Kansas. It's kind of a microcosm of what we're gonna see across the country as these renewables proliferate across America. Thank you very much, Senator Thompson. We appreciate your being with us today. Our next speaker is Mike Calicrate. Uh, he's a cattle rancher, an entrepreneur, and a civic activist. He's the founder of Ranch Foods Direct, the operator of Mike's No Bull blog, and he's gonna be speaking on the state of US agriculture and solutions. Mike? Hi, I'm Mike Calicrate. I, I live in uh, Western Kansas and have businesses in uh, in Colorado Springs, Colorado. We we slaughter animals where they're at in St. Francis, Kansas, on our ranch, and then we haul carcasses to the to the urban center, which is Colorado Springs, about 200 miles away. And what this is is really just an example of of what I think we need going forward in order to be able to feed ourselves in a resilient and sustainable way. I've been fighting industrial agriculture for around 30 years. I really discovered that the big meat packers had decided to cooperate rather than compete about 1988. And by 1990 something, I had fully realized that, that I was playing in a fool's game as a cattle feeder. And, and so I started to think about how do we make the system better? How do we make it serve the, the, the people who are involved from the ranch, uh, to the worker uh, in the slaughterhouse processing plants and, and the consumer. And so in about 2000, we developed Ranch Foods Direct, which is exactly the intent of that model is to try to replace the industrial model that I think has served us extremely poorly. And I wanna tell you about a flight I took uh, on, on Friday from Newton, Kansas to Colorado Springs. Now on that path, you will cross the entire width of the Ogallala Aquifer. The Ogallala Aquifer has sort of been this, this area of industrial uh, production agriculture. Uh, the water is being pumped there to grow corn and soybeans and wheat and alfalfa hay and all these things that, that feed into the food system, but mostly in producing livestock feed below cost of production. And, and so on that flight, I, I thought it was really interesting that it looks more like an, an area that has been strip mined. 
this is an this is a model of strip mining that's applied to agriculture. And basically, it is a mining operation. Uh, they're they're mining the water. I saw sprinklers that had been completely shut down and in the in the center pivot removed. Uh, the Ogallala aquifer aquifer is in steep decline. It's it's being pumped out far far beyond its recharge rate. And and we saw a lot of sprinklers that that the end tower had been removed from. And so they're doing everything they can from a technology perspective to try to stretch the water. But this is a valuable public resource that's being mined by a few and the profits being handed off to the big food companies of, of, of the world like Tyson and JBS and Cargill and Marfrig's uh, National Beef Company. And, and so the, the water is disappearing. The other thing I see is, is a massive number of empty feedlots. These are the smaller independent farmer feeders who would feed cattle uh, the, the, the production from the farm and the manure would go back on the land in a very resilient and a very sustainable way with the manure from these livestock. Those are gone. Those are essentially gone. And the animals have now been concentrated into some very, very large operations uh, where manure is a liability, not an asset. Now, it's not, it, it's a problem. It's, it's a pollutant instead of, of this wonderful asset that builds soil health. And these are the feedlots that have sweetheart deals with the big meat packers that are that are getting prices well above the reported prices for livestock and they're able then to put their neighbors out of business and take over whatever animals that that they used to feed in those smaller uh, more uh, sustainable kind of operations and and so it was quite a shock just to see the soil loss uh, across especially eastern colorado where it's been blowing and washing away for years a huge percent of the topsoil is already gone. And so we're well on our way to not being able to feed ourselves. And, and you know, you, you, you talk to people and they say, yeah, Mike, but that, that industrial model, that corporate control model is just so efficient. And I say, really? How so? You know, my operation at St. Francis, Kansas, one man can slaughter four animals per person per day, per man per day. And these are not the most highly skilled butchers. These are young people that want to learn and they're, they're, they're learning how to, to, to process these animals, but they can get four animals per man per day. The biggest Tyson plants, the two biggest Tyson plants at uh, Dakota City and Garden City, Kansas, uh, we're looking at a, less than 1.6 animals per man per day. So who really is more efficient? How about water use? The big plants are using over 700 gallons per animal processed. At my small plant in St. Francis, Kansas, we're using between 30 and 50 gallons of water for animal processed. And so the big lie of economies of scale and efficiency is really an, an efficiency about extracting wealth. It's about how do they extract the wealth from the farmer, from the rancher, from the land, from the available water resource, and reward their shareholders and top executives. That's what they're really efficient at. And so it's a model that's failed. And we have to, we have to acknowledge it and we have to be ready to build the alternative like I've been working on for the last 20 years with Ranch Foods Direct. And so you think about their efficiency. When I started feeding livestock in 1978 in St. Francis, Kansas, I built my first feedlot. I had as many as 20 meat packers I could sell to. We had a really strong local regional food system at that time. And, and back then, the producer of the livestock of cattle was getting 65% of that consumer price back to the farm and ranch gate. That fell as low as 27% last June during the COVID disaster. And it's running around 35 to 40% consistently. And so there's been this massive loss of over $1,000 a head that has been taken from the livestock producer and handed off to the big corporations who are posting unbelievable returns on equity. You know, 30 some percent returns on equity at the retail level, you know, high teens to 20% return at the slaughterhouse level. But food service is the big one, the Cisco's of the world. The last five years, they've averaged a 43% return on equity while workers, farmers, and ranchers are just going bankrupt and, and workers being mistreated and, 
and forced into dangerous working conditions. None of that exists, essentially. None of that exists in the alternative, more local regional model like, like I have uh, tried to develop uh, with Ranch Foods Direct. And so now what we see too is, is we see uh, you know, fear of inflation. Uh, the fear of inflation is real and they're talking about it, but we have to really distinguish, is it inflation or is it price gouging? And we saw what the big packers did with COVID. They, they shot the price of, of beef up to the retailer and food service companies, recapturing a lot of what they'd handed off to the retailer earlier. And at the same time, they reduced the price of livestock because they have the market power to do it. And it's their job to maximize returns to shareholders. And, and so they're in a position of monopoly power. They are exerting that monopoly. Well, for the last 50 years, we've ignored monopoly power. We've allowed all the mergers and, and the acquisitions and, and the buyouts uh, to, to occur to where now we have just a handful of companies in, in all these various industries across the country that have the power to extract unfair amounts of profit from the various industries, whether it's lumber uh, or whether it's beef uh, processing and, and distribution. And so what I'm suggesting is that we go back to the land, that we develop policy right now that rebuilds local regional food systems like we had 40 and 50 years ago. The ones that were destroyed by the concentration and consolidation of, of a handful of monopoly players that were cooperating rather than competing. I'm saying policy should make it easy for people to go back and build rural communities, restore soil health by by bringing livestock back. Livestock should be at the center of the new farm and the new ranching operations. We need to think about how do we build soil health? How do we sequester carbon through good, well-managed grazing programs? Right now, China is copying the US model of production agriculture, this industrial model. In fact, the biggest pork producer in the United States is Smithfield, which is owned by China. They kill every, one of every four hogs in the United States. They bought thousands of acres of land in the United States. And essentially, the United States has become part of China's plan to feed themselves at the expense of the United States being able to feed itself. We are a net food importer today on a value basis. The Indian government, the other massive population on the planet uh, like China, is tr also trying to impose the U.S. model of industrial agriculture, which is, we know, seriously destructive. It puts people off the land and, and it mines instead of, of a sustainable model that builds soil health. And so the Indian farmers are fighting very hard to avoid that trap of being enslaved by a handful of global corporations. And they've been, and of course, there's a lot more Indian farmers as a percent of the population than there is U.S. farmers. And so they're making a lot of noise and we, we should support that movement in India to keep family farming alive and expand it rather than have it uh, put out of business by the handful of global corporations. We need to build this community of farmers and, and local regional food systems so it serves the consumer. And so it serves all of the things that we care about from climate change uh, to the way animals are treated, to people that live on the land and actually create wealth through the production of, of food uh, that they share in the economy, that they earn a living income. That is not true today. They're being enslaved more and more all around the world into these industrial models. And, and so we need to avoid that. And I'm suggesting that all the money we're spending in the, in the U.S., uh, on building it back better, that we build back the most critical infrastructure. And that is the ability to feed ourselves, those processing facilities. And what about those facilities being connected by way of public markets in urban centers, complete with all of the processing space so that the farmer and the rancher doesn't have to be out that expense. That could become more like a public utility Oftentimes, utilities replace monopolies throughout history. Let's let a utility type model come in and provide the, the food producer access to the consumer. And that can be done more in the, in the framework of a public market. 
or perhaps a, a co uh, uh, location where you've got the baker and the meat uh, market and the brewer and the coffee roaster drawing in those consumers as an alternative to the Walmarts and the dollar stores and, and the big box retailers uh, across the country. And then what we need to do, and we need to do it now, is we need to enforce strictly the antitrust laws. We've already got them on the books. Of course, they've been diluted. There's been some seriously bad judicial decisions made that have given the green light to big meat packers, for example, to break the, the Packers and Stockyards Act of 1921, which broke up that monopoly of that day. And, and so we need to reassert what is the purpose of antitrust? And it's, it's to prevent monopoly, which we now have in full force. And so Congress is looking at some various options right now. We have their attention. Let's push very hard to enforce antitrust law uh, that protects the producer and the consumer and the new food model that we want to build out. That's going to be very, very critical going forward. And so that is, that is what I have to offer today is, is the idea of building the alternative. Avoid the global economy. Avoid the global monopolies uh, that are now currently uh, uh, extracting the wealth from, from the economies of the world. They have to go away eventually. We can't get rid of them overnight but we can certainly start building an alternative alongside their model and strictly enforce antitrust laws, step in, take care of the workers that are being exploited, you know, start building these local regional food systems and reviving our rural spaces. But please, we've got to focus on rebuilding soil health, sequestering carbon. And we do that through agriculture and we do that through a livestock centered agriculture. So thank you for having me on today. And I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all. Bye. Thank you, Mike. And uh, I understand you'll be available for the question and answer session. So I'm sure you'll have some questions coming. Our next speaker is from Japan, Daisuke Kotagawa. He is a former official of Japan's Ministry of Finance and was for a time the director for Japan at the International Monetary Fund. His topic today, valuable lessons on the financial crisis from experiences in Japan. Mr. Kodigawa. Um, I was in charge of financial crisis in Japan in 1997. Those days, Japan was the target of critics who believed in the so-called global standard and accused of accumulated non-performing loans based upon Basel rule agreed in 1988 by members of BIS. Same group of e economists at IMF attacked Asian countries such as Indonesia, Thailand, at the time of Asian economic crisis. Their backgrounds were really undiversified. Almost all of them were male and holders of PhD degrees in economics from prominent British or American universities. A British expert in Japanology joined Goldman Sachs and made up a groundless estimate of the amount of non-performing loans in Japan. He and Goldman Sachs made a fortune in dealing with non-performing loans business in Japan. Major securities houses in Japan, such as Yamaichi and Sanyo, went bankrupt. And large banks, including long-term credit bank and Nippon Credit Bank, had to be nationalized, engulfed by attacks by critics from the United States, the United Kingdom, and their followers in Japan. The Financial Services Agency of Japan it executed very tough examination of bank assets across the board in accordance with the Basel rule and announced its result to the public in 1998. Based upon the publicly announced results of the examination of bank assets, the Japanese government 
injected public money to stop major banks from collapsing. Banks' lending policies were tightened up to the level that was never seen in Japanese history, and many Japanese companies went bankrupt. With this backdrop, considerable numbers of people committed suicide, including my former staff in the Ministry of Finance. Board members of failed financial institutions were arrested for alleged window dressing. For the next 10 years, Western countries made fun of Japanese economy as lost decade or lost two decades. In Southeastern Asian countries, such as Thailand and Indonesia, which suffered from Asian economic crisis and had to accept the IMF conditionalities, some numbers of ministers were put in jail. Now, it is important to touch upon the history of the Basel rule in enactment, which caused one of such financial crises in Japan. Since 1980, global financial markets have expanded dramatically, but on the other hand, issues such as accumulative, accumulated debts and increasing derivatives transactions have become major concerns. In addition, the United States Europe which wanted to invest in Japan in the 1980s and enjoying prosperity only, only among develop, developed economies, asked Japan to open up its financial market. The US financial institutions lent large amounts of loans to Latin America at high interest rates in 1980s, which were going bad. And many Wall Street financial institutions were in deep crisis, including Citibank. Those days, Japan sought to become the second largest shareholder in Bretton Woods institutions such as the World Bank, which reflected Japan's rank of GDP. Japan's G GDP became world number two in 1968, but even in 1983, its shareholder ranking in the IMF and the World Bank remained at number five. I was in charge of the negotiation of this ranking issue of the World Bank in 1984. After the last meeting of the negotiation, the United States suddenly overturned the agreement and started to press for the opening up the Japanese financial markets as a precondition for the second largest shareholding. Despite the strong domestic opposition against opening up the, the market, we finally succeeded to reach the agreement. Alongside the market opening, aiming at collecting the trade imbalance between Japan and the United States, the Plaza Accord in 1985, double the value of Japanese yen. However, the appreciated yen also contributed to the overseas expansion of Japanese financial institutions, especially in London. In this process, the profit margin of British financial institutions, which had previously earned exorbitant interest, quickly fell to one tenth of its former value, and many famous British financial institutions with long tradition went bankrupt. In order to stop such invasion of Japanese financial institutions into London, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision established a rule that as banks engaged in international operations to maintain their capital adequacy ratios of 8% or more, as a standard. This rule superficially reflects the past experiences in securing transactions in global financial markets, as failed financial institutions were characterized by a decline in their capital adequacy ratios. However, the real intention was to block Japanese banks from invading London, as I explained. Economically, 
Japanese banks didn't need such a high level of buffer due to prosperous Japanese economy. The United States under Franklin uh, Roosevelt, facing Great Depression, introduced a regulation to separate investment banks from commercial banks called the Glass-Steagall Act in 1933. The act had been revised gradually starting in 1980s and was completely abolished in 1999. This created a huge problem in US financial market. If a commercial bank is under the same group's umbrella of an investment bank, the government has to defend highly leveraged investment by the investment banks because if left alone, bankruptcy of an investment bank would lead to the bankruptcy of the commercial bank and depositors' saving would be lost. When Lehman Shock came into force, no examination of financial statement was conducted in order to conceal the devastating situation of the financial statement western banking supervision authorities did not announce the data result of bank examination based upon the Basel law instead they introduce the notion of stress test, which is a completely fake notion to check the health of financial institution. Why? If at the starting point of the examination, a certain bank is insolvent, how its assets would be affected by the economic stress would not make sense at all. If the United States authorities had observed Basel wall, insolvent US banks should have been liquidated instead of being bailed out. Some presidents of US banks, which were owned by foreign banks, confessed that they were quietly encouraged by US supervisory authorities to commit window dressing so that their banks would not report insolvency. As a result, nobody in banking community in the US or nowhere in Europe were arrested nor punished. No Western countries seem to care about moral hazard. Bailing out even investment banks would lead to a moral hazard of bankers who know that the government would always save them. US Congress at that time, adopted a resolution which asked the Association of Certified Public Accountants to freeze mark to market accounting for a certain period, despite the fact that it was advocated and demanded by Western countries at the time of financial crisis in Japan and Asian financial crisis. Short selling, which the United States told the Japanese authorities not to suspend in the 1990s was prohibited in the United States after the Lehman shock. Economists such as Roland Summers and Tim Geithner demanded at the time of financial crisis in Japan that Japanese banks with trouble should be closed down using the notion of hard landing. This notion was thrown away by them after the Lehman shock in 2008 and no commercial bank went bankrupt. In addition, US government not only bailed out investment and commercial banks, it also bailed out large manufacturing companies such as GM. You can see a clear case of double standard here, and nobody in Asia pay respect to US banking authorities and experts after the Lima shock. The United States completely lost reputation as a fair country. Following the financial crisis in late 1990 in Japan, the Bank of Japan tried various measures for economic recovery, including purchases of stocks by the Bank of Japan and quantitative easing. They did not work at all in stimulating real economy. 
although such failed experience of the, of the Bank of Japan had been shared among central banks, the Fed introduced a quantitative easing in the United States in order to secure liquidity to American banks. This was followed by ECB, and in order to, pro in order to protect Japanese yen from overly appreciating due to its relative scarcity to US dollars and euro, the Bank of Japan also followed suit. Excessive liquidity through the quantitative easing resulted in unreasonable price increase of stocks and real estate. It created an unjustifiable boom of funds all over the world. There is a grave concern about the timing of the tapering of such quantitative easing, as well as the unwinding of it, which will follow. It is impossible at this moment without causing a collapse of the final bubble in stocks and real estate. Then, what we should do? It is essential to absorb the excessive amount of liquidity by the real demand coming from the rise of the real economy. From this perspective, it is absolutely necessary for advanced economies, the United States and Europe in particular, to launch upon unprecedented level of public works to stimulate their economy. It should be noted that the movement of green economy has the completely opposite direction. The world economy must get away from investment bank ridden gambling economy, which does not have any relevance to real economy. A return to the separation, separation of investment banking from commercial banking in, is a pre prerequisite against the moral hazard of bankers. The reinstallment of Glass-Steagall Act is needed. The fair application of basic rule must be secured. It is worrisome to be reported that the United Kingdom Prime Minister Boris Johnson asked a waiver of some rules at the latest G7 meeting, trying to bring about the recovery of the financial sector in London. The only thing allowed if asked to me, would be that any cross-border transactions of an internationally operating bank must be unwound before its bankruptcy. Since this means that all losses of the bank must be covered by taxpayer burden of the country where the bank is located, supervisory authorities could pay would pay utmost attention on the operation of, of banks so that authorities would not have to take such unpopular policy of bailing out with the sacrifice of taxpayer money. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kodagawa. Uh, we're now going to go to a speaker from France, Marc Gabriel Draghi, who's an economist, a jurist, and an author. And his topic for today is hyperinflation, a step of the Great Reset to destroy our freedoms. Mesdames, Messieurs, bonjour. Tout d'abord, je tiens à remercier. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, let me thank the Schiller Institute for this invitation. It is with great pleasure that I take the opportunity to speak at this international conference. I would like to start my presentation by recalling its title, Hyperinflation, First Step of the Great Reset to Destroy Our Freedoms. As we have seen over the last few weeks, inflation has clearly accelerated in the United States and in Europe over the last two months. In April in particular, the increase in U.S. prices reached 4.2% and then exceeded the official 5% in May. At the same time, U.S. unemployment remains much higher than before the pandemic. Indeed, despite the second stimulus plan of almost $2 trillion announced by Joe Biden, the unemployment rate is still at 5.8% of the active population versus 3.5% in February. 2020. As far as the inflation is concerned, it is simply the highest increase since 2008. The specter of inflation had not threatened the U.S. economy since the 1980s, and this increase is even one of the biggest since June of 1992. 
est la plus forte progression depuis le mois de juin 1992. Of course, for the moment, Jerome Powell's Federal Reserve is confident and believes that this price increase is temporary. As for Christine Lagarde, head of the European Central Bank, she also wanted to be reassuring when the ECB raised its inflation forecast in the Eurozone from 1.5% to 1.9% for 2021. Thus, for these two major central bankers, these increases are transitory and can be explained by various factors described as temporary, in particular an explosion in demand due to the recovery of activity. But in reality, in this post-war world where Western economies have seen close to Soviet-style integration, the role of these monetary institutions is mainly to reassure the financial markets that monetary policies and financial support to governments through unbridled asset purchase programs will continue and that key interest rates will not be raised. Powell has indicated that rates, currently between 0 and 0.25, could go up, but no earlier than the end of 2023. In reality, the observation is cruel. This runaway inflation that the authorities can no longer hide suggests hyperinflation, phenomenal, in the United States, but also in Europe. This inflation is, in fact, the depreciation of the dollar and the euro, and their loss of purchasing power. This Weimarization of Western economies risks being worse than that of Germany in the 1920s. In reality, faced with a five-fold increase of the world's money supply over 40 years, and its doubling over just 10 years, it cannot be otherwise. The phase of decline that began a decade ago will now accelerate and lead to a controlled collapse of our economies, as the globalist elites wish. More concretely, for those who are wondering, hyperinflation is simply a very high increase in prices. It is, in fact, an inflation that accelerates inflation. Hyperinflation rapidly erodes the value of a currency because the prices of all goods and services rise so quickly. In this case, it is the dollar that will collapse on itself, and the euro will follow with a slight delay. And then also the Japanese yen. It is therefore natural to draw a parallel with the hyperinflation of the German mark during the Weimar Republic between 1921 and 1923. This latter also occurred because of several, supposedly, temporary factors, notably the impossibility of paying the war debts. This collapse of paper money had caused considerable internal political instability and widespread poverty among the German population and had paved the way for the establishment of one of the most criminal totalitarian regimes in history, the Nazi regime. That hyperinflation of the 1920s was the result of several factors, including, first of all, the excessive printing of paper money, second, the international speculation around the German currency and the resulting stock market frenzy, three, finally, the inability of the government of the Weimar Republic to repay the unsustainable debts and war repayments incurred during and after the First World War. A frequently cited example illustrates the dramatic situation of an economy suffering from hyperinflation. A loaf of bread in Berlin, which cost about 160 marks at the end of 1922, cost 200 billion marks at the end of 1923. In November 1923, one US dollar was worth 4 trillion 210 billion 500 million German marks. Obviously, it is not difficult to make the connection between the financial situation of Germany in the 1920s and that of our Western economies in 2021. Today, we are facing the biggest money printing experiment in history with excessive quantitative easing policies that have been implemented since 2008 to save the system with the famous principle of too big to fail. Then the abysmal government debts aggravated by the, 20, the, COVID 20, the COVID-19 crisis 
In the USA, the public debt has reached more than 100% of GDP, and in France, more than 120%. That weaken the states and subject them to the financial markets, and then the multiple social political problems that follow. This over-liquidization of the markets weakens the states and makes them open to the control of the financial markets. The world pandemic is in reality a pretext for our elites to impose their great reset and their totalitarian post-pandemic world with deep growth behind a green mask. Because yes, with the bursting of the biggest speculative bubble in history, the dollar and the big fiat currencies, the euro, the yen, we are changing the current financial era and slowly sliding toward a phase of gigantic collapse. As in Germany in the 1920s, with the current Sovietization of the Western economies, synonymous with fictitious activity in Europe and the US since March 2020, with the fake support policies where almost any type of business can generate income, business failures have become exceptionally rare, as evidenced by the 2020 figures, both in the United States and in Europe. The health crisis has thus suspended the normal process of natural selection by which non-essential and inefficient elements would normally have been eliminated. And what might seem good at first glance will, in reality, turn into a destructive illusion for our economies. Since the generalization of whatever it takes of the COVID crisis, we have definitively left capitalism to enter another regime that of top-down administered economies in the hands of the financial markets. Today on Wall Street, we can see that speculation alone, without adding anything to the wealth of the United States, has become one of the most important activities. The fever of joining this movement has turned a rapid mark and has infected almost all American classes, also in Europe. With the craze around cryptocurrencies and on the stock markets via the Robinhood platform, for example, everyone is currently playing the market. And when the market is called BlackRock, you can understand that the game is flawed and that we are facing the biggest fraud and economic illusion in history. In fact, for the past few weeks, it seems that we are rapidly heading towards the ultimate stage of this great reset. Insiders already know that defaults are going to be on the rise, corporate bankruptcies are starting to happen, and the global asset bubble, despite this year's record U.S. market capitalization, is very close to bursting. Yet everywhere we look, it is clear that most people don't know what is really going on. Most are still hypnotized by the pandemic. The program of spoliation of property and collapse is still hidden by our elites, and it will be until it is too late. That is, until hyperinflation and the breakdown of supply chains actually impact us. In reality, through hyperinflation, which will be a controlled financial chaos, in a world of central bank's omnipotence, we are heading toward the abolition of small private property and at the same time of most of the public liberties that come with it. Indeed, the trend of digitalization of currencies, the dollar, digital euro, announced and in preparation, the promotion of ecological Malthusianism, the increase of the omnipotence of central banks and investment banks, at the expense of moribund commercial banks, the coming months could well usher in a new hybrid system, both socialist and neoliberal, articulated on a global scale, thanks in particular to the progress of big tech. Indeed, although monetary policies have been very accommodating for several years and interest rates are zero or even negative, allowing some people to borrow for 25 to 27 years without having a solid income and a job, the trap is slowly closing on what remains of the middle classes and the self-employed in the Western world. Thus, if a strong political response does not arrive in the coming weeks, like the yellow vests in France, then or other strong and independent social movements. In the coming months of 2021 to 2022, then the health crisis will be followed by the most serious financial crisis in history. And this financial cataclysm will sweep away everything in its path, and its main cause, before hyperinflation, will be the biggest solvency crisis in history. 
But what is our future? In fact, it is already clearly announced if we look at the publications of the World Economic Forum for the last few months. In the year 2030, the establishment promises us a world where nothing will belong to us anymore. Not a car, not a house, not your clothes. As BlackRock explained in Bloomberg newspaper a few days ago, the United States will become a nation of tenants, just like Spain and France, which are already implementing the end of private property. For example, the Spain of 2050 plan and the policies for access to real estate implemented by the Paris City Council since March of 2021. The solvency crisis, crisis and the future hyperinflation will lead to a multitude of bankruptcies which will then bring legitimacy to tax increases but also a destruction of the various social safety nets, the decrease or end of the pensions, the abolition of social security, destruction of public services, etc., while liquidating in parallel the independent economic fabric to the profit of the big economic structures. On the other hand, once hyperinflation has produced its effects, it is not at all impossible that the states will cancel private debts, notably real estate credits, in exchange for our right of ownership of the land and a rent to occupy the buildings. We will then all have the right to the British emphatutic perpetual lease leaseholding system because obviously to respond to the greatest wave of bankruptcies and mass unemployment in history in addition to the universal income as klaus schwab indicates in his book the great reset the hyper class will certainly propose a program of debt cancellation partial or total restructuring in exchange for some of our fundamental rights property free and informed consent to undergo medical treatment etc moreover with the digitalization of currencies the digital euro and other central bank digital currencies, CBDCs, that are advancing, the control and surveillance of individuals will then be total. Obviously, in the face of this debt reset, it will be necessary to set up international negotiations which will also aim to deal with the thorny issue of the final de-dollarization of the world economy. A global currency, the famous GovCoins, promoted by The Economist, perhaps in the form of several continental digital currencies, could then be created. And it is not excluded that at first, while digital, this currency will be backed by gold to launch this new international monetary system and thus inaugurate the final phase of the new world order. The finalization of the Basel III agreements, dear to the Bank for International Settlements, which will apply in the coming months, 28th of June 2021 through the 1st of January 2022, should play a significant role in this process. Jusqu'au 1er janvier 2022, devrait jouer un rôle significatif dans ce processus qui se terminera a priori en 2028. The end of small private property may seem to some to be insignificant, but in reality, this phenomenon is indicative of the society of control that awaits us. For when a community of individuals does not own its housing and its source of income, means of production for the self-employed, on a large scale, the society is no longer politically free. What happened to the Irish peasants during the Fallenlass incident of mass eviction in the 19th century will be imposed on all the people of the world when Agenda 2030 and the Great Reset through inflation are applied. Of course, since we are all employed or worse assisted, the questions of compulsory vaccination, mass surveillance and political persecution will be on the table. For when a people no longer own their land, their housing, and their tools, they are no longer free. They are truly slaves. The stateless, transnational establishment knows that economic freedom is the sine qua non of political freedom. And the half-Soviet, half-neoliberal henchmen who will manage our lives will always be in the hands of the stateless financiers, and they will apply the programs imposed by the hyperclass, namely the total enslavement of the majority by and for a small minority. Finally, 
More than 200 years ago, in 1802, the President of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, made a prophetic speech that may echo the situation we are currently experiencing. This great visionary figure had declared, I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than whole armies ready for battle. If the American people will ever allow private banks to control their money, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and the corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent that their fathers conquered. In 2021, that's where we stand. So tomorrow we have a choice. Defend our freedom, our work, our homeland, or die as slaves. I thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Mr. Draghi. Uh, we've come to our final speaker now. I want to again give you the email address for questions for the question and answer session that will be coming up. That's questions at schillerinstitute.org. And we'll have plenty of time for uh, a back and forth among the, the uh, panelists also. Uh, our last speaker is someone who's been an organizer with the Schiller Institute for many years, a trade union leader in Colombia, Pedro Rubio. So, Pedro, uh, the floor is Hola, un cordial saludo. Saludos de Colombia. Eh, bueno, participando en este diálogo internacional. Hello. Greetings from Colombia. I'm happy to participate in this international dialogue, presenting the proposals and agenda needed not only for economic recovery in the midst of the pandemic crisis, but also the call that the Schiller Institute has issued for a global mobilization for health systems that can respond not only to the current catastrophic crisis, but to others that may be coming. The crisis is a result of the fact that man has not managed the biosphere correctly, and the biosphere is out of man's control, just as Lyndon LaRouche and Vladimir Vernadsky warned would happen. On the situation in Colombia, it is very worrisome. In the four main cities of the country, there is critical overcrowding in the hospitals and especially in the ICU units. We've received reports from medical personnel and other sources in the hospital system, and they describe the situation as being worse than war. Medical bodies are essentially making decisions about whose life is saved and whose is not. This hellish situation is the result of neoliberal economic policies in the health sector, which is being downsized and dismantled based on the perverse logic of cost-benefit analysis that has been implemented in Colombia over the last 20 to 30 years. It's the same thing that has happened worldwide. What are known as private health plans provided through financial intermediation. In Colombia, like many other countries, there has been an experiment in neoliberalism with regard to the health system in which cost-benefit analysis has won out over providing public health services. Based on the logic of the financial market, the health model in place is that of vertically managed health care companies that are run by financial interests and by banks. This has been very well documented by the Schiller Institute through the research they have done on the world and on Colombia specifically, in particular on the famous international or British organization NICE, National Institute for Care and Health Excellence. Their policy is that a small group, an elite, advises countries like Colombia on the health reforms that have to be implemented. 
Their policies are based on the logic of Malthusian depopulation promoted by Prince Philip of Edinburgh working through NICE. They insist that the logic of cost-benefit profitability prevails, which means the reduction of medication, the restriction of services, and so on. Financial interests and the profitability of the system take precedence over public health. The same has happened in the United States and in various parts of the planet, such as the famous Obamacare, which EIR extensively researched and documented. These international consultants are implementing in countries not only of the third world, but also in the so-called first world, policies that go way beyond doing business and rather establish a population control policy through the health systems that are in place. This is fully documented and today it is more than evident in the specific case of Colombia. The COVID pandemic is producing worrisome figures in Colombia. We have about 4 million and 60,000 confirmed cases and we've got 102,600 deaths. And these are the lives that have been lost, which could have been avoided if we had health prevention policy and if we had a system prepared to respond, not only from the epidemiological point of view, but also in terms of primary response, as well as in terms of science and research technology to study what we should anticipate for the future tecnología y la investigación que es a lo que se deben anticipar los sistemas de salud la situación pues no solamente se suma crítica en Colombia por la the situation is critical in Colombia there is a collapse of the health system to the point that there are no ICU beds available there's no oxygen and our so-called health heroes the frontline workers are facing all of this and trying to save lives any way they can even exposing their own lives. There are many cases where these medical personnel haven't even had to make their own protective equipment, especially in the public hospitals. Complaints have been filed by organizations of health workers that the investments made for ICU units in Colombia have all gone into the private system, whereas the vast majority of the population have no health care coverage and have to use the public hospitals. At the same time, we have a social explosion underway in Colombia as a result of the accumulated effect of neoliberal economic policies. The pandemic comes on top of a crisis of a model that has already failed miserably, and people have taken to the streets to protest in the midst of the pandemic without adopting protective measures. They have taken to the streets to protest because there is really no health system, there is no employment, no food, no future opportunities for the current generations. As of today, we have had more than 40 straight days of social protests in the streets of Colombia with blockades. Youth in particular have come out to demand changes in the system. This poses a real challenge that we have. The situation is partially the pandemic crisis, but we also have a generalized economic crisis that has sunk the country and generations of young people between 18 and 30 years old have taken to the streets to demand a better future. Sobre ello, pues nosotros, desde, pues desde las redes organizadas del Instituto Chile, we and the networks being organized by the Schiller Institute have promoted an initiative to elaborate on the World Land Bridge proposal for the generation of large-scale employment and on the need to put the system through bankruptcy reorganization. This is perhaps the most critical situation mankind has faced since the 14th century. We have a pandemic and add to that austerity and draconian economic measures. 
The government of Colombia has decided to bail out the bankers rather than to save the national productive system. They have delivered more than 40 trillion from a special recovery fund to the financial system, supposedly for them to then deliver it to the productive system. But the bankers' little game is that they have made the decision, given the restrictive credit conditions in the country, to keep the funds for themselves. Entonces, pues aquí no nos queda de otra sino abrir un diálogo internacional. We have no choice but to launch an international dialogue. The only way to face the situation of the crisis of the health system is along the lines that the Schiller Institute has proposed, a world health system organized around the principles of physical economy. For instance, to measure how many kilowatts of electricity are needed, how much water, and so on. That is, a whole mobilization to be able to face the situation of the pandemic, but at the same time it must be a mobilization to be able to urgently reactivate the economy along the lines of the American system of political economy, to reactivate large-scale employment in record time, generate millions of jobs in order to get humanity out of the existential crisis, and to be able to reach a new phase state of growth, well-being, and development. In Colombia, we continue working with the organized sectors of society, with trade unions and others. We continue presenting the internationally coordinated agenda we are discussing today in this dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, before we go to the question and answer session, I have some sad news to pass on. Uh, Mike Gravel, the former senator from Alaska, who had courage and principles uh, galore, some qualities lacking in today's members of Congress, he passed away today at age 91. Senator Gravel read sections of the Pentagon Papers into the congressional record. And he participated on a number of occasions with the Schiller Institute, especially when it came to questions of war avoidance and fight against the uh, military industrial complex control over U.S. institutions. So we, we send our condolences to his family, and uh, uh, he's someone who will be greatly missed. So we now come to the question and answer session, and we have received a lot of questions. I want to start with one for, I think Paul in particular may want to take this up. Uh, it's essentially a request for a summary of how LaRouche's four laws can address this crisis. It's from Justin Price, a member of the House of Representatives in Rhode Island. And he said uh, in his note, Lyndon LaRouche made numerous economic forecasts for over close to half a century. LaRouche was right. The Malthusian post-industrial ideologies are the source of ruin. The good news is we can still listen to Lyndon LaRouche. How can LaRouche's four laws work to get us out of the present mess? So Paul, you want to take that first? Uh, yes, um, this is a very big question. I, I'm going to try to take it on directly um, and hopefully not in a great deal of time. Um, <clears throat> but starting from the top, what we usually call uh, LaRouche's fourth law, that is the necessity that recovery has to be led by science drivers um, of investment, specifically uh, fusion and plasma technologies, both the breakthrough to crash programs for the breakthrough to fusion power, and in the process, the development of plasma technologies and laser technologies and uh, relativistic beam uh, technologies for industries of all kinds, um, and the space program, uh, crash uh, program in uh, concentrated or let's say epitomized by the moon Mars mission. Um, now, we certainly cannot say that either of those is being done now, although uh, the space program has been given a uh, baseline boost by the re-adoption of the Moon Mars mission in, uh, in a serious way under the Trump administration, it appears to be continued so far. Um, but that uh, baseline boost of, uh, again, expanding the mission and uh, attempting to accelerate the mission of uh, returning to the moon, developing it, and and uh, basing it as a uh, 
stepping stone to travel to Mars. Uh, that, of course, requires, the latter requires that fusion and plasma technologies be developed in order to propel those rockets to Mars in anything less than seven or eight months. Um, that has not been funded. It has been stated, um, <clears throat> and uh, that is good. But it has uh, quite clearly not been funded, and uh, the the uh, mission is extremely is being squeezed uh, quite a bit, extremely by the Congress. That would, particularly the the space side of it, immediately. That would uh, form a driver as it did in the 1960s. Um, it would form a, a driver for the development of new infrastructure, thereby breakthroughs in science and technology, uh, thereby uh, <clears throat> new productivity levels in the U.S. economy. Um, then if, if uh, as I discussed in my presentation, I don't need to I don't intend to go over it again. Uh, the the commercial banks are needed in a mobilization, a remobilization of the productive forces and of productivity in this economy. They have to be a major channel for the credit, which uh, can be initiated uh, by a national bank, by a reconstruction finance corporation, uh, for the purposes of these major infrastructure investments. Um, and therefore those banks have got to be separated from all the shadow banks and investment banks, which are hanging all over them uh, at the present time after 30 years without serious bank res uh, regulation without Glass-Steagall. Glass-Steagall must be restored simultaneous with the issuance of this kind of infrastructure credit. Then finally, um, I know that the uh, legislature of uh, the House of Representatives of of uh, Rhode Island has um, recently endorsed a national infrastructure bank, uh, <clears throat> and that uh, one way, either by nationalizing the Federal Reserve or by creating such an infrastructure bank on a Hamiltonian model, uh, which of course includes the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which was clearly on that model. Uh, under FDR. That has to be accompanied by the credit being used for the infrastructure frontiers which are most needed. The ones which were most are most advanced will also tend to be the ones which are most needed. And I, I could only just briefly mention the ongoing desertification of the western half of the entire United States, as well as Mexico, and parts of Canada um, as a result of what is now nearly a 25 year intensifying period of drought across the West, which is clearly desertifying the West. Um, and will, if we continue, if, if elected officials continue to ignore it as they have, and to pretend that there are no solutions to this because it's really just ineluctable climate change, uh, and therefore, we have to uh, salute and bow to it. If that insanity continues, the population in the western half of the North American continent, a large part of it, will simply have to leave, and it will become a desert. Now, there's no greater uh, infrastructure need in the United States than that. It also, if we undertake the major uh, water transfer programs from other basins, especially Alaska and the Yukon, um, then uh, that problem can be dealt with over a period of about a generation. Had that been started when, when meteorologists already knew this drought was coming in the, at the end of the 1990s and that it was going to intensify, that in, huge great project equivalent to 10 or 12 TVAs would have been completed by now and the West would not be facing that uh, terrible uh, drought and the potential future of desertification. That is merely on the U.S. scale, even more urgent perhaps globally. We've already discussed the uh, provision of modern health systems in every nation. The vast majority of nations lack them. 
And therefore, this is an immense investment. These kind of investments, this is LaRouche's, what you might call his third law, these kind of investments are quite, quite different from uh, an infrastructure uh, bill which aims to put a lot of money into repairing roads, bridges, potholes, uh, rail, uh, rail systems, which already exist. Uh, and which make, as we saw in 2009 with the ARRA, the so-called Stimulus Act, which make a next to zero contribution to productivity or productive employment, and um, in, in fact uh, raise only uh, that that strange measure called the GDP. So um, that's what I would say, uh, just to answer it quickly, but it is a very large subject. Well, and to, to build on that, there's a follow-up question. Maybe Dennis and, and Jacques would like to comment. Uh, Stephen Kaler, who's a Schiller Institute supporter, uh, sent in the question, Biden may soon meet with Xi Jinping. Then a much bigger summit could be arranged between the leaders of the U.S., China, Russia, and India where they could agree to construct a new Bretton Woods credit architecture. Wouldn't this subsume a global Glass-Steagall Act, uh, which would freeze two quadrillion dollars worth of gambling claims while making credit available for physical economies? Uh, Dennis, you want to take that? And Jacques, uh, you can also weigh in on that. Go ahead, Dennis. Yeah, sure. I'm very glad to see appearing on the screen our friend Pedro Rubio. I didn't expect him, but that's excellent. We can um, manage, I'm sure, to deal with any of the interpretation issues that will come up. Uh, the The idea of uh, the Biden Xi summit is important, just as the uh, the, the summit between um, Biden and Putin was important. But it it really is sort of the question that Linda Larouche raises at the outset of In Defense of Common Sense, which I quoted which is you have to save the drowning swimmer. You have to do that. But whether or not this is actually durable survival or only momentary survival depends on what you actually do next. And I think the substantive question in this is, yes, we do have to move uh, from these bilateral meetings into a global meeting. LaRouche laid out the idea of a four powers type of summit of the United States, Russia, China, and India for a variety of reasons, those four nations because of their world responsibility, their demographic potential, their economic potential, military might, et cetera, et cetera, uh, as being a, a key starting group to pull in the rest of the world around this thing. But the crucial question is the content here. The question is, what is the economic policy actually going to be uh, when people sit down to have this kind of meeting? And that's where there is no evading the issue of Lyndon LaRouche, as many people will try to do simply because it, they might think it's uncomfortable. The, the point here is straightforward, and Helga emphasized this repeatedly in her opening remarks yesterday, which is that the global pandemic, the situation around the COVID-19 pandemic, both threatens the existence of the species in itself directly, immediately, because this is absolutely not under control by any means whatsoever. Uh, but it also poses the more fundamental question of what are the measures necessary to actually, actually stop this? In other words, a, a danger so great that it puts on the table for people issues that they would prefer to avoid, such as, for example, to simply provide a global health system of the sort that's needed, you have no choice but to launch a breakthrough, a series of leaps in technology to be able to create the kinds of institutions and, and health systems that are required in the developing sector and in the advanced sector as well. The simple basic physical economic parameters requires a level of production of energy, of food, of water and so on. Doubling is just a general idea, but that can only come from uh, leaps into new forms of technology. In other words, you have to not only produce more energy, you have to change the way you produce energy, the, the organization of energy. You have to change and vastly increase the energy flux density of the sources of power so that everything is going to be on the table. And of course, what is evident under those conditions is that this cannot possibly be done under the current monetary system. 
this system is completely, totally bankrupt beyond belief. It's something in the range of two quadrillion dollars in derivatives, assets, and so on, as was indicated, a little more, a little less. It depends what time of day it is. And that is simply going to have to be reorganized. So what we have before us is the kind of existential crisis of our species of the sort that we have not faced really since the 14th century. And the issue there in the 14th century was not, well, what can we do to put in a little bit of rodent control to stop the spread of the disease? You had to have a complete total renaissance. And that's what happened with the golden renaissance, the Italian renaissance and so on. So I think that the issue that's actually posed here, I agree with the question, we should definitely pull together such a meeting. We need a new Bretton Woods. But the point is that what has been placed before humanity is a crisis so great that we have to examine and force others as well to examine the very axioms upon which the current mistakes have been made. And let me just conclude this answer by raising a question which I found quite fascinating. We can perhaps return to it a bit later, but Mike Calicrate in his remarks threw out the idea of, well, maybe what we need for the food sector is a utility like we have in the case of uh, electricity or had in the case of electricity and water and so on. Maybe the proper relationship between the individual producer or the family farmer and the general good has something to do with the role of government. Not that all government is bad. All government is not bad. Bad government is bad. <laughs> but good government is not only good, it's necessary. It's absolutely required under the American system of political economy. So this opens up a whole area of the proper role of government in finances, in food, in health, in energy, in every single area, including in the area which Helga referred to also, and I wanna put this on the table for discussion as well. She talked in her remarks about the need to move towards the reorganization, towards the reconversion of the US economy, uh, the, the, the swords into plowshares idea, given the role of the military industrial complex, of course, Linda LaRouche talked about this uh, at some length. We have done some work on this area, but this is now an immediate point of political organizing, which I think we have to take up. And it addresses the underlying issue of what axiomatic changes in our thinking are required to bring about a successful, durable survival and not merely saving the swimmer who is drowning to death at this very moment. Well, Dennis, in fact, we have a question for Mike Calicrate on the federal food utility if he's on, but I, I'll come back to that in a moment because I'd like to hear from Jacques on this uh, question of the potential for a, a new Bretton Woods system coming out of a four power agreement. I mean, Jacques, with the continuing fractures within the EU, the, the political crises, the collapse of parties, uh, the, the disputes going on over whether or not to talk to Putin or not, uh, the failure of the economic policy so far by going along with quantitative easing. Is there potential support for such a convening of a conference for a, a transformation out of the current system to a new Bretton Woods? What, how do you see that? Uh, you're muted, Jock. You have to unmute. I think you're muted. You have to unmute yourself. Yes, our present monetary and financial system is a zombie. So our challenge here is to create enough pressure to create a human one, not a zombie. And we have a problem. Of course, it's a domination of the financial oligarchy, which is exerts power in the Western nations, but have some tentacles also in non-Western nations. At this point, this oligarchy has taken over the control of the minds of the political leaders. And these political leaders, the problem we have is that today, as it was stressed yesterday, they look for certainties to assert their power. And instead, what we need is people committed to a scientific principle who look for uncertainties, search for uncertainties, to master them for the common good. And this is a challenge. It's in a certain way what's happening in China. If you look at the Chinese Communist Party, which has been, in a sense, a spine to control investments, foreign investments in China, and to create the conditions for the uh, 
uh, one, uh, one Belt, One Road initiative, uh, they are trained mostly from as engineers or scientists. And they have this view of the world, which is rather different from our Western leaders, who have been at this point trained in such things as the uh, John Kennedy School, which is a shame for the name of Kennedy in Harvard, this type of administrators, high level administrators, or in the School of Public Administration in France, or in commercial schools, which is even worse, which are taking over now in a country like France, uh, the positions, while under the goal, people around him were mainly from a scientific background. So at this point, what is creating in the population a sense of new commitment is that they understand that the money who has been issued is fake money. So then comes the principle of how we issue money from a government principle to develop uh, a common good and the future of our countries, future generations. So in that sense, the national banking principle and the credit principle is the key. And the point is who is, is in control of the credit system. And then how it has been used until now for and to enslave people through debt. So this question of the debt is creating a lot of interest here in France. And I think it should be uh, used as a way to, to show to people what has been done to them. And the yellow vest here, and uh, also people from similar social backgrounds are interested by that. So I uh, would finish this as a, uh, as a conclusion saying that in that sense, it's very important to put together people who are working in the army, in the police, or in the firing departments, who here are the public service, and the population. They try to separate them by all means and create, you have seen that with the Black Lives Matter in the United States, or uh, the crazy things around the capital, they try to separate sections of a population. They have to bring them together to create the conditions of a pressure in our respective leaders to go to this meeting. And this meeting is absolutely necessary, mandatory. And Elga, Elga Zaplarouche, thinks that a health question, and she is absolutely right on that, would be a way to create this sense of community. And I would add the food policy and education, as I said, and this would revive in people a sense of citizenry, which is now lacking. And with this sense of citizenry, we can have a very, and I'm optimistic on that, a very rapid upgrading of the mental qualities of the people. And this is our work. And I think that this conference has raised this issue, not always uh, not always as, as such, but uh, much more, and it's much more important as a principle and a principle for us all. On, on that, Jacques, as a follow-up, uh, it was clear from the elections in, in France last weekend, as you reported, that almost 70% of the voters abstained. So when you talk about a, a civic sense, uh, clearly no party is addressing these uh, concerns. Uh, how do you reach out to the 70% that's not voting and bring them into this process? 70% is the addition of the abstention, the white vote, and the void vote. It's 70%. has never seen in whole French history. It's a first. It's the first time ever. It's 15% more than in 2015. And people think that these regional elections are a nonsense, except all people, rich people who have voted, that's why the conservative vote was relatively high. So what has to be changed? It's, what has to be changed is to give back to the people this sense of citizenry. And there are all kinds of movements who are raising the issue. But it's a, in absolute disorder. And what I call for is for a national unity, a national unity to reestablish the conditions, then nationally, internationally, where that we would be 
the principle of the advantage of the other, the principle of the Westphalia Treaty, mm -hmm. nationally and internationally should be applied. And then we would go against what Tony Blair said in 1999, it's the end of the Westphalia principle, is the end of the nation. Mm -hmm. What we want is a community of principle among nations and a community of uh, public health policies for the advantage of the other, which means very clearly the advantage of the poorest, poorest nations. And for France, the big challenge is Africa. We should do to Africa what we never did before, which is create the conditions for the development and the uh, integration of African countries with a common development that will help. And what I say every time is that this can only be done with uh, a coincidence with a Chinese policy in Africa and also an American policy in Africa. This seems absolutely impossible today to the French elites. But I think if you put the idea that what is needed is what is real, then you get suddenly people who think longer and tend to think in the with a long duration. The advantage of China is that they think 50 years, 60 years, maybe more ahead. We are thinking in, in, in France, our political uh, leaders or so-called leaders are thinking about the next TV intervention or about the next electoral vote. And this is nonsense. We have to reestablish a sense of thinking in the long term, which would be what would lead into a really necessary and immediate, and the difficult thing is immediate, meeting of the main leaders of this world, the United States, China, India, and Russia, but also, as Putin said, the countries of the Security Council, which have nuclear weapons and who were the, in Russia's, with Russia's eyes, the winners of World War II, the two things have been put together and to have a principle which would be a principle ahead of anything that has happened in the Western world since at least 40 to 50 years. So we have to rethink the basis of what we have done and many of what not done to reestablish this principle that Dennis and Paul uh, referred to or developed. And we have to think of it outside of a rules of power and go back to a sense of national, international public law and sense of development of this or the other through this law. Okay. I'm told that Mike Calicrate can be heard, but we won't be able to see him. Uh, is that right, Mike? Are you there? Yes, I, I can uh, see you and I can, and I can hear you. Okay. Are, can you hear well, we have a question for you that, that uh, Dennis brought up, and it was sent in from uh, Bob Baker, who I assume uh, you mentioned the need for a federal food utility. How would that work, and how would it affect the rural farm and national economy? As I've been listening uh, to the speakers this morning, I, I, I was thinking about the economy in, in the terms of a, of a human body, uh, the circulatory system within a human body. And, and I think that we need to think about how to build a circulatory system that feeds every single cell in the body the nutrients it needs. And, and think about an economy, maybe from that perspective, and the economy we have today being a highly uh, concentrated, centrally planned type system with much of, of our body suffering from stroke, uh, inability to even breathe or survive in, in any way. We've been shut off from the economy. And I think that's been done through the monopoly power and, and the concentration of, of wealth into the hands of a few. And I, and I just and I also think about pumping trillions of dollars into an economy that that doesn't have a healthy distribution of wealth uh, aspect to it, and basically as a result, those dollars end up in the pockets of the of the of the folks that are controlling that flow of money. And today, that would be, for example, the Walton family, uh, Jeff Bezos, and a, and a handful of, of of very very wealthy Americans. And so when I, when I think about the utility concept, uh, we have got a food system that is so broken and so lost to monopoly power and so really disassembled 
Uh, we've destroyed much of our infrastructure over the last 30 or 40 years. And now, for example, we have four big meat packers that control 85% of the market, two of them Brazilian, uh, just in the beef sector. Pork has got a, the big one there is Smithfield that's Chinese owned that we talked about earlier. But when we provide a utility, basically what we're asking is, is taxpayers to support themselves in a, in a new sustainable and healthy food system. And, and so this uh, idea that Jock uh, talked about of uh, consumers, basically people, becoming citizens again. How can we transform that aggressive price shopping consumerism back into supporting our local regional food systems and becoming citizens again and becoming involved in, in our government? And, and I think the public market idea, the food utility, where taxpayers build it and thereby support it becomes a place of community organizing as well as a place to provide the access to the producer, to the consumer, and the, <clears throat> the infrastructure to get the processing accomplished that the raw material from the farm needs to be able to be consumed on a consumer's plate. And, and so I think it really becomes a, the center of a community. And we tried to do that. For example, in Colorado Springs, we tried to build that model, and it was, it was some very, very heavy pushback. Now, the developers like the model as long as they own it and can collect the rents on that model. So what we've seen here in Colorado Springs is, is the introduction of food halls, which is basically those many of those same uh, small businesses that are trying to access the consuming public, but paying high rents to, to developers. And, and so it, that model doesn't work. If it's a utility, then we are going to make it almost failure-proof. Uh, and, and to the extent that we don't control the monopoly that currently exists, the public utility can take the hit. It's taxpayer owned. And then there will be a much better response to monopoly power and in, 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 in to controlling that. But basically what I believe is that farmers and ranchers need to be able to stay home, not run off to a farmer's market. And it, it, those have all, those have basically failed the, the, the farmer and rancher. Most of them are too big anyway to, to sell at a, at a farmer's market, but we need a new bigger infrastructure that gives them access while letting them stay on their farms and ranches and providing that stewardship that is so critical in healing much of our environmental damage and providing good husbandry to livestock. That is what a farmer and rancher should do. And we as taxpayers should make sure, as citizens, we should make sure that those most important wealth creators in our economy have a fair market with living incomes and full access to the consuming public of, of the United States. And so I see consumers as an infrastructure project building these food hubs essentially in these cities. And when you talk about food hubs, all we've really seen is failures in food hubs because of the monopoly market they're competing in. But also these food hubs have to include livestock processing uh, because much of what's growing on the planet today is grass and put through livestock. It's a tremendous wealth creating possibility, but we have to be able to turn it into edible product for consumers. And that infrastructure is expensive and we need to let the public own it to begin with and then incubate many more small businesses from these sort of food hubs and processing centers. That's, that's my thoughts. You know, on this question of utilities, I think you'd also find people increasingly interested in breaking up the monopolies of the social media uh, and the way they control the, the narrative. Now, I, I have a question for all of you, which you know, I think is, is implied by what you're saying about how do we get people involved uh, how do you break this uh, uh, demoralization in the population or uh, seeming indifference to the suffering of others? I mean, Helga has often spoken about empathy. Now, here's a question that you know, is quite pessimistic in its approach, but it, it does get to this question of what it's going to take to move people. Someone writes uh, that 
there's been no real physical economic recovery based on the general welfare, uh, which is LaRouche's idea, will it take a total blowout of the globalist system before LaRouche's four laws are enacted? So let me throw that out to anyone who wants to take it. Dennis, you might have some thoughts on that. Well, there is a blowout going on already. The question is, is this going to also bring down the physical economy uh, to the point of making the species disappear? Hopefully not. Um, the, the change does not come about by convincing the majority of people to go to the voting stations and vote and you get a majority to change policy. It doesn't work that way. It never has throughout history and it's not gonna happen that way this time. It's gonna take a handful of individuals, a relative handful as it did in the, in the golden Renaissance to provide a concept and a policy solution which people turn to under conditions of crisis and duress. So I'm not, I'm, I'm both more pessimistic and much less than the question implies, more pessimistic in the sense that I think that the crisis is actually far worse, far, far worse than most people understand or are prepared to face. Um, and a, a tour, a mental tour, a factual tour of what's happening in the developing sector in Africa uh, with the millions of people who are facing death uh, what's going on with COVID in countries where there is no vaccination occurring whatsoever, where there is no public health system, where there are no conditions for people to protect themselves. They must go out and work so-called in the informal economy, or they'll be dead from lack of food two days later. So I think the situation is actually much worse, but it's also much better because change doesn't occur the way most people or I've been taught that it occurs. It occurs because an idea takes hold. It's an idea that takes hold and it does so because everything else around stops working for people. And the circumstances of this pandemic provide exactly that kind of opportunity. But it's only an opportunity. It depends on uh, those of us who understand how this process works and who have been trained by LaRouche and uh, uh, in working in this direction to actually get this idea out far more broadly than it now is. And this process of these, of these uh, conferences is exactly that. That's the intention here, is to broaden that discussion, get it out as far and wide as possible. Now, I, I wanna come back to this idea of the, uh, of the, uh, the whole idea of a food utility, but from the standpoint again of this question, because if you look at what happened again in the 14th century, it was very few people who developed a classical cultural as well as a scientific renaissance uh, was the people such as Leonardo da Vinci or such as Nicholas of Cusa. And the, the issue here, the way to get around this problem of pessimism is by giving people access to that process in particular through culture, in particular through classical culture, in particular through music and, and Anyone who's ever done any recruiting of anybody in any part of the world knows that the last thing people give up, they'll give up their commitment to Aristotelianism, they'll give up their views on Adam Smith, they'll even throw Newton into the pot and say, okay, okay, you're right, you know, it's Leibniz, not Newton. But tell them they have to stop listening to the crap music that they listen to today. That's where you have the fight because people hold on to that. They hold on to it for emotional reasons. They hold on to it because they think that's what they like. And until you can change that internal process of what's going on inside them, where they identify their personal interest, what gives them personal uh, joy, not hedonistic pleasure, but personal joy is doing the common good. Until that switch occurs, you've got a problem. And I think that this has everything to do with this question of the role of government and, and, and uh, utilities, because the, there's this, this contradiction which is always presented to people, the individual and society. And society, government, limits the individual. Which are you for? Well, we have to have a balance, and these are opposed. Well, that's not what the Renaissance was all about. That's not how the United States was founded. The concept of the Renaissance is the concept of a coincidence of opposites, a solution of this, that the greatest development and joy of the individual is in doing the common good. This is Leibniz's concept of, of happiness. This is Cotton Mather. This is Benjamin Franklin. 
This is the idea of the, of the general welfare clause. And then you have the Enlightenment, which comes after the, after the Renaissance and destroys or tries to destroy this idea with the introduction of Romanticism, again, crap music, which introduces the idea that everyone has their own personal emotions and they can all feel what they wanna feel and their liberty and their freedom resides in their personal uh, ability to do whatever the hell they feel like doing and society be damned. And this is very widespread. It's very widespread in the United States under this idea of rugged individualism, which is very different than the idea of Cotton Mather and Benjamin Franklin. So we're gonna go have to back, go back to this method of solving problems, Kuz's method of the coincidence of opposites. What was made into a governmental form in the American Revolution, the concept that the greatest good for the individual comes and joy for the individual comes from accomplishing this, this general social goal. This concept, if you think about it, is the basis and the only real basis for working with a Confucian China, because that is the basic idea in Confucianism. And that takes us back to the four power agreement, what you're going to have to really pull together to make this thing work. So I think that, it's, that, that the issue is both, it's more complicated and more interesting than perhaps may have been intended by the question, because the way change occurs is not by linear accretion of a bunch of people coming around to a view. It comes by the power of an idea and a cultural change, which produces a total transformation in the standpoint from which people consider problems in general and their own personal identity. And that happens in a time frame which is not the chronological tick-tock of the clock of normal J. Lee political activity. We are in that kind of period. The tick-tock is over. The question is, can we create the change and the time and the sense of individual uh, identity in a sufficient number of people to bring about that kind of change? We have to make sure that we not only save the swimmer, but we introduce the essential principles for a durable survival of humanity. Well, and for those who are uh, planning to be with us later and those who don't know about what we're doing later, the fourth panel is titled The Coincidence of Opposites, The Only Truly Human Thought Process. So we'll be taking up these questions of culture that Dennis was just, just uh, elaborating uh, in much greater detail in the panel that will be beginning at 2 p.m. later today, Eastern time, and uh, that's 8 p.m. Central Europe time. Now, we have a question that... that actually gets at some of the scientific basis of economics, uh, which we've been talking about, but this is a, an interesting question from Ernie Shapiro. He writes, Lyndon LaRouche boldly rejected the validity of the so-called second law of thermodynamics for the economy and the biosphere. Instead, he introduced anti-entropy as a universal principle. Please discuss how this optimistic view underlay his ideas of physical economy, population growth, and the nature of credit, and distinguishes him from other schools of economics. So which of you would like to take that up? Well, I, I think one more, if you allow me. Go ahead. Why don't you go ahead, Jacques, and then, then Paul can weigh in on it. Just a short word. Uh, yeah. What is being destroyed in the minds of people is their memory of the past. And they have been, the history is being destroyed. So, in that sense, people have no more reference to what has been accomplished in the universe and what all human history is about. So, to learn and see human history from the standpoint of the love of humanity, therefore the love of human creation is the key to change completely the directionality of things. I would say something else uh, after uh, how the mind of people is being destroyed. But we have a whole effort to accomplish, to recreate in the minds of people the references that make them capable to generate thought, thought ideas. And these thought ideas is the beginning of science because it challenges, uh, uh, it challenges undue uh, powers and it creates the necessity to create positive ones. Paul? 
Well, this this question from Ernie uh, requires panel five. I guess we'll have that tomorrow um, <laughs> from nine o'clock till three in the afternoon. Um, but to uh, to deal with it briefly, uh, I, I just there are two connections that strike me right away. One is to the previous question and the uh, answer that Dennis just gave to it. And and uh, I think underlying that question was, should someone with good intentions for his or her nation and the human race wait until there is a complete global financial and economic blowout and then begin to organize for the Rouge's four laws or for a new bread and wood system or for recovery? Um, the answer to that question involves the question of optimism that's involved in when, when Linda LaRouche always uh, attacked the second law of thermodynamics. You don't wait because the, the, the assumption of waiting is that if you start to speak to people now under conditions of what may be the beginning of a mass strike, that is the crisis which has clearly hit people, may be beginning to make at least some of them stop thinking about themselves and their families only and start to think about the more general good of their neighbors, of their fellow citizens, even of humanity as a whole. If you take the uh, view that because <clears throat> the human race is clearly does not follow the second law of thermodynamics, and the human race has been able to use and even change the laws of the universe in certain ways in order to continuously increase its population density on this planet now for tens and thousands, millions of years, and has continued to do that with a succession of uh, technological revolution after revolution after revolution. And each one of those technological improvements has laid the ground for the next one. If you understand that about the human race and that that is characteristic of the human mind and the way it thinks, then you don't think that if you go out to speak to people now, if you go out to organize now in this situation of, of clear crisis, but also of polarization and so on, you don't think that your efforts will be wasted. That would be what the second law of thermodynamics would say, that your effort and your energy in uh, bringing a new order into the way some of these people are thinking would be wasted. It would be diffused like uh, so much uh, work that it turned into mere heat energy. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, therefore, you had better wait until everything comes down and then go out and try again. You would be operating according to the second law of thermodynamics, but the human race and the human mind does not operate that way. Um, and this was basic to LaRouche. LaRouche started talking almost from the very beginning, from the late 1960s, from the very beginning of his organizing of his politi uh, political tendency about the idea of a political mass strike and that that idea seemed to originate with the famous English poet, Percy Shelley, uh, when he was still a teenager, uh, at which point he became an organizer. He started writing and printing pamphlets, getting them printed, and going, not even to his own country, but across the channel to Ireland in order to distribute them. And Shelley, uh, wound up developing an idea of the role of poetry in human history, not that poetry caused certain things to happen, but that periods of a flourishing of great classical po uh, poetry indicated that underneath that there was a flourishing of ideas of the common good among at least a, an increasing portion of the people. And that it's that, and, and he defined, per, uh, Shelley 
defined what he was trying to organize as exactly that, not not big demonstrations by trade unions and so socialist groups or whatever, but rather the tendency of people to some people, increasing numbers of them, to stop thinking only of themselves and their immediate household and to have thoughts about the welfare of others and even potentially of all the others in the human race. And that's what you are going out and looking for in your organizing. And you will find, if you do it, even right now, before everything has completely blown out and collapsed, you will find, if you do it, that you will increase the mental energy and the mental uh, alertness and liveliness of the people that you are talking, of some of the people that you're talking to. You're, you will start a process which will continue. That's basically the essence of it. I mean, we could discuss it in terms of Lynn's idea of the importance of great projects in in economic development. The the uh, water is brought into the California Imperial Desert for the first time before the First World War, uh, before the Second World War. Um, by a Colorado River water is brought there through the Imperial Canal, and what happens? Lynn has this. Uh, Lynn had this idea of uh, potential relative population density. As soon as that canal is bringing in that water, the potential population density of that whole area goes way up. So that means that that area is all of a sudden, which looked like a desert before, is all of a sudden underpopulated and needs a lot more people to come and live there and build irrigation canals and grow biomass of all kinds and uh, uh, provide markets, local markets for produced goods, manufactured goods of all kinds, increasing the division of labor, increasing the uh, energy throughput of every part of this process. And this then will propagate itself further so that the measure of that kind of progress is not the temperature, the average global temperature of the earth. I mean, that is nonsense to say that the, the uh, anti-entropic process of increasingly orderly handling of energy and life in the biosphere of the earth is measured by the so-called average temperature as measured from space or a variety of things on the surface of the, of the oceans, but rather the increasing prevalence of well-ordered life of all kinds, human life, plant life, animal life, the increasing prevalence of ordered, self-reproducing life of that kind all over the earth. Um, and that was what underlay, I mean, what, what Mike Calicrate just brought up in his talk, uh, I even wrote it down, uh, the um, livestock should be at the center of the new farming model. That is a statement that uh, indicates a definite optimism on his part about the way in which the universe and agricultural land and, and market economy around agricultural land operates. To say that just because he's saying the opposite of what the Green New Dealers say. They say, let's get rid of livestock. Let's, uh, along with fertilizer, of course, let's essentially go back to uh, dirt farming because it releases less carbon into the, at uh, less carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, but that is, a, a, obviously anyone can think about that. It's a degradation of the order and the productivity and the, uh, the orderliness of the agricultural economy to do away with the livestock and the, the uh, Im improvement and building of the soil and go back to dirt farming with horse-drawn horse plows, if you even allow the horse to be in that picture. Um, so this, this is underlying uh, LaRouche's approach to development projects all over the world for uh, his entire career. 
let me just add one one comment on that. Then we have a couple questions on Colombia, and then we'll go into some final comments. Uh, I think LaRouche made clear his view on the second law of thermodynamics, that it's actually a fake scientific justification for genocide, because human life could not propagate and, and continue if the idea of the heat death of the universe is the reality. And what Lynn always pointed to was the, uh, especially from the Renaissance forward, the increase in life expectancy, the increase in population, the increase in, in productivity as a sign of the creative potential to overcome what otherwise was being put forward as the second law of thermodynamics. So I, I just wanted to add that. Now, Dennis, I, I don't think we have Pedro on, but there are a couple of questions for him that I think you can take. Uh, one is from someone you know, Sebastian Acosta, uh, and a, a woman named Ruth from Colombia. They're basically saying that while there are critical aspects regarding the pandemic and the socio-political situation in many countries, uh, what's happening in Colombia now is dramatic. Uh, as Pedro indicated in his presentation, if something is not done now, uh, how could you change the course in Colombia at this moment? And the, the other the question from Ruth is, can you bring these ideas of the Schiller Institute into a national popular assembly so people be would become clear about the criminal reality they're facing and how the ideas of LaRouche can be brought into the solution? The, the situation in Colombia is critical. It's absolutely the case. You saw some of those uh, videos that, that Pedro showed. Um, there is, you could call it a mass strike. There's huge popular protests going on. Um, I would argue that we are still in the process that's been going on for six, seven, eight years of a international explosion against the existing establishment and its institutions. What LaRouche pointed to at the time with a Brexit vote and what that was all about, the election of Donald Trump, which was not a national phenomenon in the United States. It was part of an international uh, rebellion going on against uh, established institutions. Uh, we saw that in the vote in Italy with the previous government that was elected. We saw similar things happening in Mexico, where in this case, a left populist government, not a right populist government, was elected with Lopez Obrador in an overwhelming vote. And you've got people in the streets now, but people in the streets is both uh, a potential for change. It's also very dangerous potentially, especially under conditions of the pandemic. Uh, what's going on, I've watched these videos from Colombia and I've talked to our people down there, Ruth and Sebastian and others, and it's youth who are out there. It is young people who really feel that they have nothing to lose. They have no jobs. There is you know, 60, 70 percent of the Colombian economy is informal, quote unquote. A large part of that informality is the drug trade, especially in the rural sector. Younger people have no choice, zero choice, but to either become part of the drug trade or disappear. And their whole families disappear. You want to know the problem of immigration from Central America or Mexico? Shut down the drug banks in Wall Street and you'll see an immediate improvement because people are in that category, that half of the world labor force that are effectively unemployed. So we've got a big crisis, a very, very big one. And Colombia is a very good example of this. Peru, similarly, people have had it. But the danger is that in both cases, Peru and Colombia, like in many parts of the world, the British and the State Department and Wall Street and the city of London are driving people into the dead end of polarization, into a polarized society the left versus the right, the liberals versus the conservatives, and so on and so forth, under circumstances where mere radicalization under the current circumstances is going to take you to fascism, because people will say, we've got to do something to stop this. Uh, and this is a well-known phenomenon from the 1930s, how this worked. So the, the answer for Colombia is not inside Colombia. That doesn't mean you can't do anything in Colombia. And what I'm saying here applies to every country in the world. You have to act in a country on the basis of acting on the totality of the universal political process underway. That's what LaRouche always did. And that's how you can affect the world. 
I'll be very specific. The most important thing that people in Colombia can do is support an Argentine-Mexican alliance to join with the Belt and Road Initiative. The president of Argentina, uh, Alberto Fernandez, is scheduled still to go to China to sign an agreement for joining a memorandum of understanding to join the Belt and Road. Um, and that allows for, creates the basis for, in fact, bringing the Belt and Road into the countries of Iberoamerica. There is no solution for these countries without the Belt and Road. And you cannot have the Belt and Road functioning in places like Mexico or Central America or South America without the United States joining in. It's exactly the point Jacques was just making about Africa. It has to go through a global process of reorganization. There is no other way that's going to actually function. On the other hand, if countries like Colombia or people who are active politically in Colombia or in the Dominican Republic or El Salvador or anywhere, or Mozambique, or Ivory Coast, or anywhere in the world, act in such fashion to change that total global picture, such as in this particular case, building a strong movement for Argentina, Mexico, jointly pushing for a China, United States economic policy of cooperation around the Belt and Road. That's the way you can transform the situation. And our job in places like Colombia, under desperate conditions, under conditions of extreme radicalization, extreme danger of every sort, is to provide a cool, clear, but passionate representation of what is in fact the solution. And as exactly as Paul was saying previously in, in, in what he was discussing with Shelley, you are not going to recruit 100 out of 100 people and you're not gonna recruit 50 out of 100 people. But if you recruit one out of 100 people that you're talking to, you have the seed crystal necessary for the kind of, of change in policy that's required. You build a movement in the United States in particular, as we are doing here, which is in tune with that international process as Lyndon LaRouche always laid out. There was never anything that LaRouche did in the United States, which wasn't focused on this international process. It's a, it's a figment of the imagination. It's falling into the trap of the, uh, the, the dichotomy, the, the non-solution of CUSA, to think that there is somehow an American solution to an American problem. And that I think is the approach that we have to bring to this and in particular to our friends in Colombia who are fighting under very difficult circumstances, uh, no worse uh, for sure than the situation in Africa or other places. That's the approach we have to take. It is the vital concern of the Schiller Institute, all of us in every part of the world to make sure that this battle in every place in the world moves forward in a single unified direction. Okay, well, I think we've come to the point where we're going to do a, a summary from everyone, uh, a, a brief summary of what, what you uh, reflecting on the discussion today in this panel. Uh, is Mike still on? Would, would you like to say something, Mike? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I, this has really been a great uh, uh, panel here. I've learned a, a lot and <clears throat> am very excited to hear some of the views of the speakers and, and their thoughts on how to go forward. Uh, one of the things that I run into uh, is when I explain the situation that, that I live in, in the food sector of our economy, and, and overall the, uh, in the economy as well, uh, people get very uh, discouraged and, and depressed. <clears throat> and I always suggest that to start with, I think we need to go back to community. We need to go home and make our place better. You know, help our neighbors, uh, become citizens again, become involved, you know, with the school board, with the city council, uh, maybe you need to run for mayor and at some point, you know, hire office, but go home and make your community as good as you can make it. You know, I went to a land grant college, uh, Colorado State University, graduated in 1975. And I just remember, you know, the, the ag and business schools teaching the concept that agriculture, farming and ranching is not a way of life. It's a business. And I just look back on how wrong, how wrong that was. You know, the idea that, that we have to be uh, in an economy where it's the survival of the fittest, 
Uh, the biggest in today's economy, especially the biggest cheater wins. There's no rules. Uh, there's no referees on the fields. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we care a lot about how the football game goes and how well it's it's refereed. And and we, you know, come up out of our chairs uh, when, a, when uh, one of the referees makes a bad call in a football game. But we don't seem to care about the economy we're living in. And, and that rules be applied there that make sure that it's fair, open, and competitive, and that it serves the community and serves all, uh, as opposed to just just a few. And, and so I, I'm asking, you know, I suggest to people, go home, get to know your neighbor, uh, understand we're all connected, and, and do what is good. Uh, it, it's under your control right now. And then we build into the bigger issues that were so well covered today about the global economy and the risks and the in the in the future that we we have to look forward to if we don't do something. So thanks for uh, allowing me to participate today. Well, thank you, Mike. You made a real contribution to the discussion. Uh, why don't we go in the reverse order than when we started? So we'll take Dennis and then Paul and then Jacques. So some summary thoughts, Dennis. You know, sure. Uh, the, the Schiller Institute is very actively involved in organizing a youth movement internationally. And I want to underscore this because I think the kinds of changes that are required, which we've been discussing, this complete axiomatic change in the concept of the economy, the concept of the individual, the view of the physical universe, of the sort that came about uh, during the period of the Golden Renaissance, that is a youth revolution. That's, uh, it's not limited by chronological age, but the idea of a youth movement that LaRouche always fostered throughout his entire long, very young life was repeated youth movements. Um, some of us were involved in youth movements a little earlier than others, uh, but the concept is to take the entire, your entire future, long or short, in your hands in the sense of changing the entire world. And there are youth today, and again, I bring back the idea of Colombia, of youth who have had it. They've simply had it with everything that's going on. But the key to the kinds of change that's needed is for those sectors in particular to be organized around the ideas of Lyndon LaRouche. Um, I think there is a very special role to be played in all of this by bringing to the, to the youth and to the world Lyndon LaRouche's works. There's a project that was launched out of Mexico by our youth movement down there, but which is spread across Ibero-America. And I want to use this occasion to promote that it actually be uh, extended across the world, which is get LaRouche back in the universities. LaRouche has to be studied. He has to be part of the curriculum. The biggest crime of the incarceration of youth of, of LaRouche and of a number of others of us who went along for the trip uh, is not what it did to LaRouche or what it did to others. As bad as that was, the biggest crime and the worst damage was done to the population in general who have been denied, denied access to those ideas of LaRouche. Youth today are demanding answers. Those answers have in fact been provided in general terms by LaRouche. We have to make sure that these ideas are in fact available. There will be new initiatives coming forward from the youth movement around the idea of bringing LaRouche back into the university curriculums and the work of the LaRouche Legacy Foundation, which was established in the few months after Mr. LaRouche's death in early 2019, hopes to play a very central role in this process to make those kinds of ideas available. Uh, and that I think is an initiative that we should uh, strengthen with what we have done today and use it to carry us forward into the next ongoing part of this discussion with future conferences. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, Paul? I uh, wanted to uh, bring the Glass-Steagall Act um, in particular back into the forefront of what has to be done, uh, what we have to uh, uh, organize for, because um, there's been in the last year and a half a tremendous, uh, during this period that I was describing of the central bankers regime change. There has been in that period of time, a tremendous amount of political and social conflict, break, uh, 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 populations breaking down into 
uh, or being broken down, at least in part in the media and so forth, into uh, totally opposed uh, subgroups, ethnic groups, and so forth. This has uh, excused from the whole uh, public discussion, if we could call it that, the banks of the city of London and Wall Street, who are responsible uh, both presently and historically in terms of the the uh, lack of public health uh, investment and expenditure in all the advanced countries, not to mention the developing countries, it has left those uh, those uh, banks out of the uh, public discussion. In fact, they they've even along with the central banks like the Federal Reserve, started to be treated as if they were elderly geniuses uh, <clears throat> who uh, uniquely were above the fray and understood the uh, truth, uh, that their belief is the truth, namely that uh, the source of value in human life is trade and speculation and money, and that those who have more of the success with that speculation are better than those who have less. And in fact, they may be the geniuses that we need to count on and so on ad nauseum. That has to end uh, in, in every way that's been described here, including uh, what uh, Mike Calicrate has described about the completely sick uh, food economy that, that exists in this country and where it came from including uh, what uh, Daisuke Kodagawa went through in his really uh, very valuable presentation, because this is a man who uh, has been through the all of the financial crises and bubbles and blowouts uh, of the post-1980s uh, deregulation, post-Glass-Steagall era. He's had to manage them as a Japanese Ministry of Finance official and as an IMF official. He's been a keen observer of them in other countries uh, all over the world. He's had to negotiate about bank policy with, uh, as he put it, the PhDs of London and, and uh, New York, uh, the economics PhDs, American and British. And his statement that a crash imminent now can be averted only if we break these banks up and if we go to a, a cooperative international program of investment in, in uh, new infrastructure and in great projects of infrastructure. That's an invaluable uh, insight from uh, Japan and from his worldwide experience. So uh, we really uh, need to put that back at the uh, in in the center, along with the uh, campaigns that we're involved with, to put that back in the center of our understanding that uh, this uh, atrocity has to be stopped. This uh, incessant process of bailout <coughs> and creation, larger and larger and more and more monstrous and immense mega banks, which do not lend money but yet dictate policy to everyone else. Uh, this has to be put an end to and, and all of the other um, disorders and derangements of the economy which they have uh, led to can be untangled in the process. Thank you, Paul. Jacques? Well, I would conclude with something pertaining to France, but not to France. De Gaulle once said that, first of all, uh, France is a certain idea, and he meant that a nation only exists if it contributes for the cause of humanity, for the progress of all, and for that you need to have the creative intuition or the imagination to be at the center of all political discussions. Today, we are in a quiet opposite situation. Look at the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, as Sadi Carnot conceived it, it works in a controlled or 
uh, closed environment. What is the oligarchy trying to do? Is they are trying to create in the population the sense that it's closed environment, this controlled environment, there is no way to get out of it. And for that, they create what uh, Harley you refer to, a culture of death, a culture of genocide, if you want to take the ultimate consequences. This is in the prevailing uh, domination of data. They are by all means trying to control data on consumption, of course, but also on politics and on the very perception that you have of things. So you see that in what has become a universal destruction, which is the video games who, or where you kill or you are killed. And there you have a sort of immediate perception linked to your very physical existence. Therefore, uh, your sense of uh, concentration of your mind on ideas is at loss. And uh, there are also the series, all this proliferation of series in the whole world, from Games of Thrones to House of Cards, it's proliferating. And you, <clears throat> you, we are protected in our minds and our works from that. But the whole population is highly contaminated and infected by these things. And we should see that with, at the same time, compassion and, uh, uh, let's say, uh, sure that we have to break it. And um, this data control is also linked to the military. People see the military as something that cannot be any more mastered by a normal person. We are, they are speaking about swarms of drones. They are speaking about autonomous missiles. They are speaking about cyber war, about space war, control of space war. So people, in that sense, and are at loss. So what we have to do in part of the youth who are extremely determined to be against that because they know that their future, uh, their future economically, like in Colombia, or the future economically, like here, where the situation in France is not as bad, but is bad, or in the United States also. These young people, well, 80, 90 percent of the young people, they are looking for an authority about something, and they want an authority which is not uh, the authority of what is prevailing in the world today, which is a fake authority and pretends not to be an authority most of the time. It's they want to create a, a willful submission. What we have to generate is the confidence in the youth people to express their creative potentials. And this means for us to be a mediation of Lin's ideas and Lin's concepts and Lin's writings. So certain people who look at it from the eyes of today would say, but something has to be done immediately. There is a sense of emergency in society where we are. And our answer should be that this concentration of the mind in Lin's writings is exactly the same as the need to intervene immediately in the world history. And what from uh, LaRouche's uh, impre from Lin impressed me the most, the most when I met him, is that every time he wrote something or every time he intervened in, in something, it was always on the basis of a challenge. At the same time of an immediate challenge, located a long, long history back in the past and a long history in the future. So he had this sense of thinking, of human thinking, as the capacity to create an environment for the better and healthiest for all. And I think what we brought, we are bringing in the Schiller Institute, with this need of a health policy in every country, would be the key not only to convince young people, but to create in young people the capacity to intervene with older people and change, absolutely change the direction of history. And it needs to be, the, to be done here and now. So these discussions in this panel, in the preceding two panels, are creating, I think, the environment where this is in the process of being achieved. But as Ben Franklin said about the Constitution, provided we keep it.
Well, thank you, Jacques, and thank you to all the panelists. Um, I, I would say a couple of things in closing. If you're not yet a member of the Schiller Institute, join now. Uh, the, the idea of the individual acting in these arcs of history doesn't start 20 years from now or 100 years from now, but starts today. And you can go to SchillerInstitute.com and, and log on and become a member. Also, circulate the videos of this conference, the, uh, the panel today, but also the two preceding panels. And then the next panel, the coincidence of opposites, the only truly human thought process. Uh, join us for that. So thank you for joining us today and uh, be back with us, I think, at, uh, in an hour and a half or so, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern time for the next panel. Okay, bye.